Peace of the Saints. We're bringing back this segment about business, entrepreneurship, establishing your financial foundation. You, of course, can send in your comments, questions via Super Chat, Cash App, and PayPal, which is linked below at the bottom. This is one of my favorite segments. This one is attended by those who are ambitious and perhaps need a little bit of inspiration and guidance. You can ask questions in real time. As you all may be aware, I have a background in various industries, textiles, fashion, software, hardware, firmware, um, and it goes on. Leather goods, uh, paper assets, real estate, e-commerce, and on and on and on. So we can talk about all of that. The good news is that business has some commonalities. No matter what industry you're in, it's about money. The moment you lose sight of that, you are lost. Sometimes we have folks who say that they want to start a nonprofit. It's always quite disappointing. <laughs> nonprofit. We're in a capitalist society. Everything you do should have some level of profit, whether it's financial profit, emotional profit, or otherwise. In my book, The Black Box, one of the basic lessons that I teach you is that as a young man, you should be highly focused on establishing your foundation and fortune. As an older, more mature man who is established, then you can consider giving back as I am doing here. One thing I want to encourage you all to do and to be is ambitious. Be ambitious, especially where your interests are concerned. For example, before I got on this live session, we all know what the basic requirements are uh, for most YouTubers to start. They want the likes to be up before they get going. That's going to increase the number of persons to whom the video is pushed out to. If you're here waiting, haven't paid a dime for the video, you want to see, gain some knowledge, you'd be wise to say, hey, everyone, get the likes up. You're doing yourself a favor. This is something that Ayn Rand speaks about. It's the informed self-interest. It's intelligent selfishness such that you can make everything you know, favorable to yourself. It'd be favorable to you for me to start sooner. And to drive that, you encourage everyone to get the likes up. And I want to let you all know that there's nothing wrong with stepping forward, stepping into a position of leadership. At the end of the day, what you'll find is that most people indeed are lambs, sadly, mostly being led to slaughter. You can be a shepherd. The world is always looking for a great leader, of which there are few. Huh? So don't ever let your interests be untended to. It is your responsibility to push your issue, to forward your agenda. But one thing I can assure you of is whether it's wealth, uh, your comfort, your culture, your ideology, no one else is going to push it forward. You have to do that. In the absence of doing such, you will see that things will devolve, the world will change in ways that you don't like. So I just wanted to give you guys that foundational piece of encouragement to remember that if you want a certain outcome, you have to push forward. Don't be shy. Don't be bashful. Victory, excuse me, uh, fortune favors the bold. Now, saints, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let us start with showing love, our tradition, show love to those who show love to you. May I acknowledge Jennifer, who booked a consultation, got one tomorrow bright and early. Looking forward to having that conversation. One of my favorite things to do, speak to people who are ambitious. Get to know folks one-on-one. -on -one. This has great meaning to me. And they're wise. They booked it before I've increased my consultation rate, which will be increased to 990 U.S. dollars. Uh, so they've saved about uh, nearly $200 by booking now. Very wise. May I also acknowledge uh, Mr. Coot, who has become a member at patreon.com slash the saint in the center. May we welcome him wisely to this, or welcome him warmly to this thing of ours. Also, may I acknowledge Carter, who writes tuition currently at work so i can't call in i understand and i thank you for that uh, support and we look forward to uh, hearing from you and certainly for all the members you'll have access to every session that i've done including the session that we did last night which was uh, in excess of five hours it was a very beautiful warm fellowship i really enjoyed it i think that much of the audience did as well so that'll be going up quite soon Carrying on. May I also acknowledge Jay. He writes, tuition, that live last night was great classic. There you go. I just, uh, I just referenced that one. And indeed, it was a classic. It was 
it was warm. You know, it was community. It felt good to, you know, be fellowshipping with you all. Shout to uh, Saint MH. By the way, shout to the Saints who are confirmed. This this gentleman is confirmed, which is to say he's a real one. He's vetted and verified. He's a man we trust, respect, and regard. He writes, tomorrow I'm starting a new 14-day sprint. Any tips to stay disciplined, which is one thing I'm struggling with. Well, number one, uh, if you're starting a new one tomorrow, uh, I surmise perhaps you've ended one recently. So uh, if I were you, I would make sure that you've A, uh, rested, and it should mean you've A, celebrated your success and your effort from the last sprint, and B, you've rested. Uh, sometimes those of us who are most ambitious, we forget to do that. You want to engage your work from a place of power and strength, and your rest is critical to that. Um, with regards to staying disciplined, it depends on where the breakdowns are. Uh, what I would do is I would design around where you're finding the breakdowns. Sometimes you can leverage the energy of others. One thing we know as human beings is sometimes we there are things that we won't do for ourselves but we'll do for other people you know some people will do things for their wife that they wouldn't do for themselves or they'll do it for their children uh, or in some cases you know say you're a person who has trouble with uh, exercising uh, you might tell a good friend of yours hey meet me at 8 a.m at my place and we'll go we'll start from here we'll exercise at my you know home gym or my apartment complex gym so meet me here at 8 a.m. Let's get it in. You know, because you regard and respect your friend, you're not going to sleep through it. You're not going to, you know, when he comes up, say, oh, hey, let's get coffee instead. You know you're going to get it in. So those are the kind of structures that you can create to force yourself to perform in a certain way. And here's another one. For example, if you're a person who's uh, arrogant or prideful, um, you will not allow certain things to happen. You will not allow yourself to fail in certain situations or while people are watching. So one thing I do, if I feel just terribly you know, worn down, you know, I'll go live during my workout because I know I'm not going to underperform, you know, while I should be an example to others. And so I say, hey, you know, turn on the camera, get it rolling, let's get it in. And that's going to drive me because I'm a prideful man. I will not fail to perform, you know, when it's game time, when the cameras are rolling, you know, when it counts, when the referees on the field or in the boxing ring, I'm going to go hard. So those are different psychological tactics you can use to drive your own success behavior. Thank you for that question. We're wishing you much success as you pursue big goals. Tony writes, if I have a fam, excuse me. <laughs> He's saying if I have family and friends uh, that would take care of me if I fail in business, should I be saving six months of living expenses? No, go ahead and get started. He writes, what skills should we learn to be valued in the marketplace. Well, it depends on which marketplace you're speaking of. Uh, there are many skills that can be valued. You know, some people are on the business side, they're in the sales side, others are in the technical side. Um, they're a um, back end software developer. Uh, you know, they can write in Python, whatever the case is. So it depends on what marketplace you're referring to. Uh, if I were you and I wanted to go into business and to entrepreneurship, I would ask myself, you know, what is the transaction I want to drive? Like, how do I get paid? So for whatever business you're in, what is the transaction? What is the one thing I'm going to sell? How do I get paid doing it? And then I would just focus on that. What, what's my immediate next step to get this transaction rolling? The key to many things, happiness and business, is simplicity. Simplicity. This is one of the things I'm going to lecture about during the Sunday service that's coming up. If you all are members and you can make it, I, I welcome you to come to the headquarters uh, to watch this free of cost and enjoy live in person. And uh, of course, you know, the multitude will be watching online. It'll be a good time. One thing I wanted to start talking about is I, I noticed in uh, the live chat some time ago, uh, someone uh, had wrote, is this a good time to start a business with this economy? They didn't super chat it, so we didn't have time to address it. But I did take note of it because it was a sad thing to see. Sad for a number of reasons. I wasn't surprised that they didn't super chat it because with that kind of mentality, you're going to stay broke, no doubt. But it was something worth addressing because I, I hope that this person gets outside of a scarcity mindset, outside of a poverty mindset. My chief question to you is this. Number one, do you guys still wipe your behind after you use the restroom? Really, do you? I'll give you guys some time to answer that question. And while you guys are letting me know if you still wipe your behind during a recession or during an economic downturn, I'll go to this next super chat. He writes, what's the best way to access a woman? He writes, for skills to help with your pursuits. 
Oh, you know, the best way is through romance. That's always been the the best. Uh, you know, you're going to get the best out of a woman when she loves you. And when a woman truly loves you and she's been raised right, she thinks of you and her as one. You know, even biblically, they speak of the joining of flesh, the oneness. And she will love you as she loves herself. And when she spends money, she's spending for us. So she'll be mindful of the expense. And when she receives money, she's receiving for the family. And so she'll share that with you. And she wants to see your star rise higher because with you, she rises. So when a woman loves you, she's going to really perform. But even beyond that, any person, male or female, most people are walking around without purpose, without guidance. They have no way to get a, the attention that all human beings seek, the, the acclaim. And as a result, what you're able to do when you're working on something real, you're working on a business, is you can invite them in and you can give them a role. Everyone wants a role. They want something to do. Many people are unemployed. You give them purpose and then you set a goal with them. Hey, you know, within this business, your role is this and you will be successful in your role by achieving X, Y, and Z and then help them make progress. And when they achieve it, you celebrate them. That's going to feel good. There are many studies by economists that prove that people don't actually work for money. And what we mean by that is increasing the pay rate does not increase uh, performance and output. However, increasing acknowledgement and things like that, utilizing soft skills is going to improve performance among employees. So what I'm telling you is that uh, being able to inspire people and let them have purpose within the context of your business is going to benefit both of you mutually. Oh, he further writes, how and when do you give a woman work when most want to just have fun? Uh, you give them work straight away as soon as you're able to. You know, and the more that a woman loves you, she just wants to be around you. And if you let her know, hey, to be around me, guess what I'm doing today? Ah, I'm working. So if you'd like to be around me, you will be around me working. And if it's a real woman, her instinct is to be helpful. You see, as I mentioned, when my mother came to Assassin headquarters and she saw all of the empty boxes from the many things that I've purchased to benefit you all, um, she immediately starts cleaning up. It's not because she's my mother. It's because she's a good woman. This is what they do. You know, if she was at someone else's house and they start cooking, she's going to say, hey, what can I do? What can I prepare? Do you want me to help clean the dishes? Do you want me to, you know, my mom, black and Southern, you want me to clean these chitlins with you? You know, where it can be done. I've never eaten chitlins in my life. They, they smell terrible. It's disgusting. But you get the point. So that's what a real woman is going to do. A, a woman who is selfish and narcissistic and perverse, she's going to be a distraction. She's going to be there trying to get you into bed. She's going to be there, um, you know, having foolish conversation. You see, they like to spend money, but they don't like to make money. A woman who can only spend your money but can't help you make money, she is of little value. And you have to find uh, strategic ways to allow them into your life in a limited way. You have to manage them just like you, you manage all things. Uh, and also ask yourself, how can you create fun? You know, even your male employees whom you pay, when you have competition, um, goal orientation, like even within a work culture, there should be fun and enjoyment. And really, I do enjoy my work and I find meaning in it. And if you can create that for yourself and for her, you're a great leader. Shout out to Mr. Snyder. He writes, Peace of the Saints, would you recommend placing debts, cars, phones, in someone else's name so that you can have a better DTI as to finance more properties. Well, um, phones, if you took out a, a loan to purchase a phone, that's not a good idea, generally speaking. So I, I do want to be quite clear on that one. There are a lot of things that you know, banks, businesses will finance for you, like the new iPhone 15. And you know they do that not for your benefit, but for their benefit. <laughs> right? And we buy things that either are beyond our budget or not appropriate for our age or appropriate for our income level. And the truth is the iPhone 15 is still not much different from the iPhone 10. Listen to me, the iPhone 15 is not much different than the iPhone 10. Huh? But the price is radically different. There's no reason not to buy a refurbished phone. And also, when you ask yourself, what are the features on this smartphone that make me money, when you wisely, as a young businessman, ask yourself constantly, well, how much money does this make me? You, you will live and think differently. I want to encourage everyone not to get the iPhone, the new iPhone. I want to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to encourage all of you not to get the new iPhone. I want to encourage you not to finance unnecessary things, huh? Pay cash. And remember this, when you're financing something or when you're using credit, you're using borrowed money. You're using money that you do not have. 
which is to say you're using money that you ought not spend because you don't have it. It's not your money. And when you take out a loan, you're promising to repay more money than you've spent. Uh, this is generally a bad deal. In fact, within uh, many religions, this is frowned upon. In Christianity, it's called usury. In Islam, it's called riba. Interest, charging interest is viewed as a bad, low-down, dirty thing. And it is. It, it entraps people. But if you can be the money lender, it's not a bad thing. If you can be the bank or the banker or the bankster, then it's not such a bad thing. You're on the correct side of the dynamic. But when you are the one taking the credit, you are losing, I promise you. So you shouldn't be financing really anything if you can avoid it. Having an automobile can be very useful, especially in certain places where things are far apart, rural places, uh, suburban locations. That makes sense. But generally, um, your credit will not be majorly adversely affected by financing an automobile. An auto loan is not going to take you down really badly. Uh, however, silly things like financing an iPhone is not going to look as good on your credit report or carrying a large balance on a credit card is going to look quite bad as well. But things like student loan debt uh, don't really have major negative impact. One auto loan is reasonably expected. Um, so you know, you'll be good to go. When you're talking about financing properties, you know, a property is going to be much, much, much more expensive than uh, a car or an iPhone. So in the grand scheme of things, and also a property, when you're getting a mortgage, there's an underlying asset. And so banks are much more willing to take greater risk on someone with subprime credit uh, because there's an underlying asset that they can take and you know, recover a significant amount of value. Uh, and this is a decent time to buy. I've predicted this. Probably many savvy persons have predicted this as well, uh, which is to say that you know, the market is down. I got a million dollar house, for example, that's valued $200,000 less than a million. You hear me? You know, I bought the house at a million dollars and then put $150,000 of work. It was a brand new house. But when you buy a brand new house, the backyard is unfinished. It's just dirt. So you have to finish it. You know, you put in pavers, you put in turf, you put in plants, all these things. And, you know, there's so many other things that you have to finish in, in a brand new house. Um, so, you know, it's lost about uh, 20%. Um, actually really it's lost 20%. And then, you know, with the value added from the you know, additions, you know, it, look, I saw one of the comps recently was listed at a million in my neighborhood house was listed at a million bucks sold for like uh, a little under 800,000. So the market is down. It's a buyer's market. In other words, especially if you have cash, you're talking about financing, interest rates are high, but if you have cash right now, it's a buyer's market in real estate. Um, and generally, remember, you should be starting small when you're getting into the game. If you're looking at a property, you're about to purchase something quite expensive, even if it's a low cost property. My first home was in Baltimore, Maryland. It was a row home. It was a modest price. I think it was a three bedroom house, uh, three bedroom, two and a half bath, if I recall correctly. And, um, you know, I started small and I'm glad I did because I made mistakes as a young man in my early 20s. I highly recommend if you are going to purchase a property, you have a consultation with Mark Pfeiffer before you do that. I think his consultation is like 350 bucks, something like that. Very affordable. Um, if you want to do that, send the cash app to me with your email and just put like, or just put that you want to talk to Mark Pfeiffer. I'll get you set up. The reason I say that is because before you're spending six figures, uh, it's worth spending $300 to make sure that the deal is good. And if I were you, what I would do is this to, you know, extract the, extract the most value. You know, I decide on the zip code that I want to buy in and just rule of thumb is you want to buy the best property in the worst zip code. Oops, sorry. Flip that around. Flip that around. You want to buy the lowest cost property in the most expensive zip code. I'm going to say that one more time. Sorry. You want to buy the most, uh, the lowest cost property in the most expensive zip code, which is to say that your property may at some level be a fixer upper. I don't recommend fixer uppers, but it might be one of the more small or modest homes in that zip code. And it's one of the, as it's the lower cost home in an expensive zip code, which is to say that the neighborhood is nice, then you're going to have a lot of value that your house can grow uh, and you know, increase your profitability when you sell. The reason that the zip code is important is because foolish people, they buy in up and coming neighborhoods. They might even buy a really nice house in an up and coming neighborhood. They're buying at the top, you know, their house is toward the top of that particular market, which means that your value is anchored. And even when real estate agents are with their client and they look at what are called comps, you know, what did other houses in your neighborhood or in your zip code sell for? Well, if you have the nicest house in the zip code, even though it's the nicest house, the data is going to pull down uh, your sale value. So you never want to be at the top of the market. 
Uh, you generally want to be at the bottom of the market, especially if you're a young person looking to make a buck rather than settle down forever with your family in a particular property. Um, and property is a it's a great opportunity. Real estate is a it's a cool game. It's a bit of a slow game, uh, in my opinion. Um, it's heavy. You know, like when I say heavy, it's like your money's not liquid if you want to move it around. I, you know, when I have extra money, I need to set it down somewhere. I'll buy some property somewhere and I use property as a bank account. So for me and also for a lot of, well, I don't want to say this together, but for me, full stop, next paragraph. Also for a lot of folks in the underworld, they utilize real estate uh, for various purposes, you know, as a bank account, money laundering, things like this. If you go to uh, Panama, which I've been to Panama many times, in Panama, it's a gorgeous city, lots of high rises, many luxury accommodations. And what you'll notice is that many of the high rises are empty. This is also true in Dubai. But many of the high rises are empty. And you're saying, whoa, why are they, all these buildings empty? It's like a ghost city, a beautiful, brand new ghost city. And the reason is you have people who are engaged in the underworld, various illegal activities, and they need places to store significant sums of money. And rather than putting it into a bank uh, where inflation is going to eat away at it or it can easily be seized, they you know have a number of companies, shell companies, and then they'll you know purchase property and use that to store the, the financial value monetary value. And that's why you have so many of these uh, commercial buildings and even res residential luxury buildings that are empty uh, in Panama. You're welcome. Uh, shout out to Saint Lotto. He writes, I go to uni and with my program, I can specialize in accounting or finance. Which stream would be best to get a well-paying job at an entry level? I think accounting is more straightforward. Finance, you know, there are a number of things you could do with finance, but it's not as directly correlated to a job. So I think that accounting is great if you're looking for an entry level job. If you would like to become wildly wealthy, finance would be a consideration or to take some courses in finance. And finance is going to be evolving fairly quickly. Accounting is you know, quite consistent such that you know even some American corporations hire uh, accounting teams that are abroad you know, in India and other places like that. Uh, as there are generally accepted principles in accounting, uh, finance and fintech are rapidly evolving. So it, it's something to keep an eye on. It's it's a bleeding edge thing and always will be. Tony Wright, I meant uh, assess, not access. <laughs> okay, let me see what you had said before. Make sure we addressed it. Ah, what's the best way to assess a woman for skills uh, help, to help with your pursuits? Yeah, her education her general achievements, you know, what has she achieved? What has she been consistent with in her life and her current profession? You know, what is her level of work and what is her level of compensation? I'll tell you guys a funny story. Uh, as you know, I have dealings with women around the world, gorgeous ones. And you know, generally the more beautiful, the less competent, intelligent, insane they are. And you would not believe how often they say, Hey, Mark, well, why don't I just work for you? And I often have to remind them like, hey, you know, the qualifications for dating and also and for you being employed by me are radically different. You don't have to be ambitious or competent for you to be, um, you know, someone I, I'm dating or seeing socially. However, for me to hire you, you do need to be ambitious. And I've not observed that in you. And, you know, one of the things I hear in the manosphere, which is just patently errant, is that they often say, oh, you know, I date a girl who's like working at McDonald's on the fries. I date a girl who works at CVS at the grocery store. Well, I, I'd, I'd slay her, but I, I wouldn't date her. That would be silly, and possibly embarrassing, and certainly she wouldn't be helpful. I wouldn't want to send her in uh, on my behalf, and, you know, she's incompetent. I have to do a lot of high-level things, you know, uh, just imagine you're dating a woman who's of low intelligence or insufficient competence and you ask her to do something basic and she can't get it done. It just makes everything a bit more weighty, you know, especially and also a woman who doesn't believe in herself is problematic. And generally women who operate in low positions, especially if they're beautiful and they're still in a low position, that lets you know they're really a low person because men will hire women for, you know, jobs they're not qualified just because they're beautiful. You <laughs> dig? Let's be real about that. St. Lilato writes, huh? oh, yes, we addressed that one. And thank you for that question. Rayshawn writes, hello, Mark. I hope all is well. All is well. And I appreciate you uh, sending that uh, positively my way. Things are fantastically well. And I'm very happy to say that I want you all, if things are well for you right now, I want you to just really 
uh, dive in and indulge in that that positivity and in that happiness because sometimes we forget to be happy about the basics. Yes, all is well for me. And that's not always the case, right? That's not always the case for any of us. All is fantastically well. Like all of my cars are in good working order. You know, my homes are clean. Um, you know, we have new properties, new opportunities. My businesses are flourishing. My, my friendships are strong. My family is well. All is well. Thank you for that. And I hope that you all are happy if all is well for you too. He writes, where can I find a high quality blank hoodie that doesn't wrinkle or shed fabric onto the shirt underneath? I want to embroider my logo on it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So number one, the question is, do you want to do that as a business or you want to do that for yourself as an individual, presuming that, um, you know, you're clued into the title of this stream and also you're clued into a money mindset. I, I would think you want to do it for business and with regards to apparel, I don't generally recommend this as an industry. Uh, however, if you'd like to go into it, I can give you some recommendations. Uh, but first I would ask you, um, these things that you're mentioning, are these things that are going to help the hoodie sell or are these things that are based on your own personal preference? We have to be able to separate the two. It's really important because, um, you know, my personal preferences are not related to the general taste of the public. And that's something that's really important for me to understand. You know, for example, I refuse to wear uh, pants with belt loops or, or suits with belt loops or suits that are not custom handmade. That's my personal preference. The average man in the society will never, ever wear a suit that's handmade. All of his pants have belt loops. So if I were to make a company and I was planning to sell jeans or pants or slacks or trousers to an everyday man, and I was saying they can't have belt loops, well, you see, I would be going out of my way to create an extra feature that doesn't add value for the consumer. So I just want to you know, challenge your thinking with that. But when you say uh, a blank hoodie, that's that's very easy to find. It, that does not wrinkle. The question is, well, under what circumstance, number one? And then number two, what materials are you seeking to utilize? Generally, hoodies are in cotton. Uh, for example, you know, Brandon uh, is producing uh, a very cool reflective hoodie, which is a 3M material. That hoodie you can get at uh, assassinbrand.com, S-A-S-N brand.com or thesassin.com, T-H-E-S-A-S-N. And, you know, so there's different materials. You can use a 3M material, uh, which is reflective. You can use a material that's typical of sweatpants. You can use a material like this jacket. And this jacket is actually linked in the description. This is like a windbreaker. You could actually use this material for a windbreaker hoodie. Um, and obviously, you can use cotton. You could use linen. So it's infinite. And the real other question that you want to ask yourself is, do I want to... Uh, have this be something that I'm going to invest more capital on to get it exactly as I want, which which is a possibility. You can have it made literally of any material you want. It can be wool if you want. It can be cashmere. You'd have to invest a little bit more money to get that level of customization. Conversely, there are other opportunities where the hoodies are already there pre-made and all you have to do is have your logo embroidered on. Um, so the question is, well, what are your preferences? And you know, an important thing is a to check with the market and then b to you know be specific and you know know what your unique value add is in terms of this product category so for example um what about your hoodie is going to make someone want to buy it like what is the feature on that hoodie that's what you want to think about when you say i want to embroider my logo on it this is uh this is everyday stuff that's easy to do um so feel free to follow up on any of those questions but the simple answer is Yes, I can point you to something and feel free to DM me and say, hey, Marquette, um, these are my specifics, you know, in response to the questions that I just asked you, these are my specifics. And then I can reply to you with a, with a, um, a resource. So you can DM me on Instagram uh, and or email me. Thank you for that question. So for example, this gentleman writes champion plain hoodies and that would be P-L-A-I-N, uh, champion plain hoodies. Yeah, and champion does produce a number of types of hoodies that you could utilize. Those hoodies are gonna be a little bit more expensive. They're already embroidered with the champion logo, which I do not like. I've done some crossovers with champion on two different products, both of which I discontinue because I don't like seeing champion's logo on my product. 
Um, so that's, you know, one thing that you, one would have to suffer in that kind of a collaboration. Shout out to Mr. Tibbs, who supporting the work via Cash App, writes, Peace to the Saints, really appreciate it. This is one of the segments of The Intellectual, along with Trending News. Shout out to uh, Michael, who just became a member at patreon.com slash the Saint in the Center. We welcome you to this thing of ours. Very happy to have you with us, Michael. And may I also acknowledge via... See, may I acknowledge via PayPal, we have uh, Mitchell here, who is one of the saints who is indeed confirmed. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, let Mitchell come on. It's, uh, 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 yes, he writes, can I come on screen? Let's see. The website that you gave me is not loading. So it's not loading. Let me try the main domain. So that website's not loading. Okay, so the the main domain of that website is loading, but the URL you sent me um, is not loading. So I will give you the link to join on, and then we'll see if we can uh, check that out. Uh, per last time, I think we said we'd uh, have people on for 50 seconds to try to give more people a chance to hop on if they so choose. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, run through this real quick. Yes, indeed, uh, Mitchell, I, I saw that that main one is working. Have this link for you. Okay, so they're both the same. Okay, got you. All right, there you go. There's the link for you to hop on. And Saints, in the meantime, you'd be wise to send your comments questions now, as the earlier the better. Sometimes I'm signing off and people are still uh, sending in questions. That is, uh, you know, I always feel bad after I end because sometimes it comes in a little bit late. Now, uh, one thing I want to, oh yeah, did anyone ever answer the question of, do you still wipe your behind after you use the restroom during a recession? Did anyone ever answer that? In case you didn't, uh, yes, you still do wipe your behind and you also still eat food. You still consume products, you know, especially staples and core products at the same rate, even during a recession. And in fact, during recessions, there are a couple industries that are recession proof, like uh, the illegal drug industry. You might see fluctuations in price, um, but, you know, and this is due to a number of supply chain issues, but in the illegal drug uh, industry, a crackhead is not going to stop being a crackhead because there's a, a macroeconomic uh, challenge. Uh, similarly, uh, when you look in the sex industry, the sex industry usually is uh, recession proof in, in as much as people are still going to continue to consume sex. Uh, strip clubs are not included when I say the sex industry. You know, strip clubs are included in the entertainment industry. But when you're talking about the illegal sex industry, it's still carries on you know uh, quite un, unchanged then thirdly i live in las vegas and the data is true here the casino industry in fact during some curious circumstances like you know during the pen i don't want to i don't want to say that word but they actually had higher profits than ever yes they, they had higher profits during a time where they should have had lower profits so in the gambling and vice industries you're not seeing that consumption is taking a significant slowdown during a macroeconomic challenge or, or a recession or a depression or whatever you might term it. So that's important things to understand human behavior. Um, so another thing you should also consider when you're thinking about, oh, should I start my business now? Because that's what was asked. Like, is it okay to start a business during a, a economic downturn? It's like, bro, are you, are you kidding me? Um, when you look at spending power, right? Do poor people smoke cigarettes? Yes, they do. C cigarettes are completely unnecessary. They hurt you. Um, they cause health issues, which means more expenses. Uh, they're very costly. Uh, but poor people still smoke cigarettes, even though it's completely unnecessary. So human beings, at some level, they're rational, but at other levels, they're completely irrational. So that doesn't mean that they're going to have a that, that indicates that they're not going to have a, a rational reaction to certain stimuli, like an economic downturn. So these are things to consider. And I say this to suggest that, you know, no, I wouldn't open a luxury brand during an economic downturn. That wouldn't be intelligent. But 
for the most part, if you're creating a product that is well-priced and has a unique value add, good product is always going to sell. You know, that's just the end of good product is always going to sell whether it's a recession or not a recession. And here's the funnier thing with regards to defining a recession. The government, and this is how we know we're living in strange times, our government is like the USSR now and that they're redefining what a recession is. And in addition to that, I had a conf- sec- my second conference. We've now stopped doing conferences. We've even had a third conference and a boot camp. But during my second conference, which was a long time ago, during my second conference, we were in a recession. That was years ago. We were in a recession then, years ago, and I was giving people strategies on how to thrive during a recession. Maybe it's just the new normal, right? And here's the problem. Two years ago when I gave that conference and we were in a recession, officially according to the way recession has been traditionally defined, if you would have said, oh, I'm going to wait until we're out of a recession to start my business, well, you're going to be waiting for two, two plus years, huh? You'll be waiting for two plus years. That's silly. You see, if you're waiting for every light to be green, you'll never press the gas button. Every light is never green. You'll go through some green lights. You'll have a red light. Then you'll go through a yellow light. You'll go through another green light, go through a red light, yellow light. They're never all green. And the persons who are saying, oh, you know, there's a recession. I can't do this or that. What they're really doing is they're making excuses, Uh, whether consciously or subconsciously, they're making excuses. Uh, the show must go on and your mentality should always be carry on. So I highly recommend that if you have an idea, you get it vetted with a, with an expert. And if the lights, enough lights are green, you go ahead and get, get rolling. Some gorgeous women walking by very shapely, gorgeous women. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Give me one second, Mitchell. I'm going to get you on. Let me just hit these real quick. And if I miss a super chat, do forgive me. Just simply give me a reminder, as you all usually do. Uh, Shout out to Isaiah. He writes, hi, Saint. How do you actively sharpen your account management skills in business? Well, depends on what you mean by account management. Um, We'll talk about that in a second. Let me read through your whole question. How do you actively sharpen your account management skills in business? I tend to focus on fulfillment and client results, but neglecting account management is hindering the relationship. Ooh, we need a lot more details here. We need a lot more details. So number one, account management can mean a lot of things, especially depending on the nature of your business, whether it's B2B, B2C, or B2G. Account management can actually, a lot of these things can be automated, and that's ideal. And usually you can automate this through your uh, CRM, customer relationship management technology, of which there are many, some of which are quite expensive, like, for example, Salesforce. Great tool, very sophisticated, and often in large corporations, they have one person who is literally hired just to configure and continuously manage that tool, but it allows for levels of automation that can drive uh, profitability. So that's number one. So when you say, how do you actively uh, sharpen your account management skills? It sounds like you're an entrepreneur running a whole business. I don't know if that's the case or if you're an employee, but surmising that you're an entrepreneur running an entire business, when you say you focus on fulfillment and client results, well, client results, uh, let's say you're, you're the entrepreneur running a whole business. We should be talking about sales, right? Like you should be focusing on sales. When you say client results, what does that mean? Um, When you say fulfillment, I know precisely what you mean. And generally, the leader doesn't want to focus on fulfillment. This is something that's fairly um, uh, basic and straightforward in as much as it does not require genius or creativity or high-level thinking. Uh, It's something that can be uh, robotic. It's something that a lower a person who's compensated at a lower rate can do. You can hire a virtual assistant. You can hire a real assistant, a young person, an intern. Fulfillment is usually the simple part of business. Uh, Once you figure it out, you just rinse and repeat. When you say client results, that's something you'd want to unpack. Well, what do you really mean by client results? And if you're the leader of the business, you need to be focusing on revenue. So revenue is the key. And if account management is core to driving revenue, then we can unpack that and talk about it, but everything that you do focus on should be something that drives revenue. And the way you engage in each part of your business can drive revenue. Often people think about customer service as fixing and solving problems, but customer service can be an opportunity to upsell. Customer service is a great opportunity to drive, uh, turn a customer into a client. Um, So if you uh, have any more details that you wanna share, I'd be happy to address it. 
And if you are uh, running a business, congratulations. Howdy, partner. How are you? I am well. Peace to the saints. Thank you for having Peace me. Saints. Nice hat. <laughs> <laughs> this man, yeah. over here, this man over here matching the eyes as he trying to get <laughs> this man is getting it in. All right, let's yeah. work. Indeed, indeed. Okay, cool. Okay. Now we're matching with the face to face. Yes, and you had a link that you shared. Yeah, with just jabrizi.com. Yeah, I'm working with Jabrizi on. I can also give it to you if you like. I'm working with Jabrizi on a content management or creation course. So there's going to be a, like a lower level offer, and then there's a higher ticket offer that we've just started working on together. Okay, you got yep, 50 it. seconds. Talk to me. So this is the web page. I was hoping that you would review it. Uh, basically, once you click this video, it will take you to the, or once you click that button, it will take you to the video where we try to upsell uh, into creating a form to apply to the course. Okay. We haven't so created a course yet. So am I viewing this as a person who's familiar with what you guys do or who Jabrizi is, or am I reviewing this as a person that's completely unfamiliar? Yeah, someone who has context behind Jabrizi because he's doing an ad or video organic ad that's bringing them to this website. Okay, so I'm familiar with him as a person. I've seen the advert. I clicked the advert and here yes, I am. Correct. Okay, yeah, thank yeah. you for that context. Yeah. So one thing that I like is that it's a single page. I like simplicity. So it's a single page. There's you know a limited number of things that the consumer can do. So that's beautiful. It seems to have a lot of text, but let's read the text and see what it says. It has. Uh, it says, yes, uh, watch the video now. Usually I like to see these kind of, if you actually are linking to a video, I like to see that embedded. So it's a, it has a play button overlaid over the image and then you just click it. So at the top it says, mm -hmm. e rather it reads, free brand secret new presentation free brand secrets new presentation okay i don't entirely know what that is but i'm going to keep reading let's see and so it reads discover the secret formulas that generate one thousand to ten thousand dollars per day so this concept of secret or the secret this is very powerful with uh, human beings human beings like mystery and they also like things that they feel are exclusive rare hidden so the language is very good for marketing that's smart um, it says one thousand to ten thousand dollars per day. I don't like ranges. I would, you know, more simply, you know, say our average customer makes eight thousand dollars per day. Um, the the range kind of drives suspicion as to okay, well, why is one thousand? Why to ten thousand? That's a big range. So I'd probably just have it as one figure, you know, five thousand plus, um, or just go with the ten thousand plus. Anyways. Um, Discover the secret formulas that generate one to $10,000 per day. That's fine. It's not a problem. It's just, you know, a matter of preference. Um, and obviously, I always err on simplicity. Simple is better. Apple has indicated this with their marketing. He writes, without needing to show my face or even have my own product. I think a lot of people like this. The average person does want to be anonymous. Uh, so you really have two extremes uh, today. You have the person who prefers to be anonymous or the person uh, who would do anything to become famous. Uh, so it reads, yes, watch the video now. So this, um, I'm presuming, is perhaps telling some more details on the offer. So apparently the video is critical because generally when I link out from an advert, the advert should have told me enough. And if I was interested, I'm coming here potentially to make a purchase, right? Because I'm not thinking about everyone who comes to my website. I'm thinking about the people who come to my website who can afford to buy. They got the money and they got the need and they're ready to make a purchase, right? So theoretically, my ideal uh, concept or, or funnel is that the consumer, let's say we're using ads that interrupt people. So the consumer's on Instagram scrolling brainlessly. And once they've been scrolling brainlessly, they're looking at big booty thoughts on Instagram. And then an, an advert pops up and it's a video with Jabrizi and explaining, hey, you can make this amount of money per day. And they're interested and they got a little bit of money to spend. So they've seen his video. How long is the video that they'd be watching? The ad. It's an hour. <laughs> I told Jabrizi we need to make it shorter. Hold uh, on one second. Hold on one second. Oh, yeah, did, you you say, did, did you say that the, the advertisement is one hour? Not the, the, not the advertisement video, but the video that you click into is an hour. Okay. Sorry, that was how long, confusing. How long is the advertisement video? Uh, we've only just done an organic video that he made, but 
we haven't done any ads specifically, but I think the ad or the oh, organic okay. video that he made, like we're, oh, we're not running any money. Video, since, yeah. The organic video is being used as an ad. Okay. So how yes, long is that one? Yes. How long is that like one? 50 minutes, 50 minutes. Jabrizi was just doing it live today. Okay. That's not terrible. Yeah. You know, I'd probably want to be in that sweet spot around nine minutes. Um, nine minutes for, for a number of reasons that I'm sure Jabrizi is already aware of. And he might have a science to 15 minutes, but I, I'd love to be around nine minutes tops. Um, but if you have them watching a nine minute video and it links out to this website, they should be ready to buy. So that's number one. Like, and I mean that strongly. Yeah. If they've watched a nine minute video and in 2023, that's an eternity. If you got someone to watch a nine minute video and they ain't ready to buy, somebody messed up, you know, something went ultra left. Okay. So that's number one. So what you're doing right now, I think from a path perspective is, 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 is a bit strange, but we're going to click it and figure out is a bit strange. Cause you're saying, Hey, watch this video now click here and Hey, watch this video. So I'm kind of like, Oh man, y'all making me watch a lot of videos here. Um, so it's not driving the transaction which is what we want to do. So anyways, I'm skipping. I'm not going to click the video right now. I'm going to continue reading what we will cover. How to use AI. We, we and don't other see your screen, by the way. Oh, right thank now. you. I appreciate that. Of course. You're hired. It's helpful when I'm, <laughs> it's helpful You're when I'm hired. live so I can interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've skipped this part and this is beautiful. This is a good button like that makes me want to click it. It's large. It's prominent. It, it's the right color. Um, so this is great. Um, I'd probably reduce number of colors because like red is an emphasis color, but this doesn't seem like what needs to be emphasized. Money uh, usually is good to be emphasized. So I'd probably just make this like a, a dark gray and then I'd emphasize color on the money a par money part. And then this mm. this punch button right here, I probably wouldn't have it because I'd embed the video and then I'd have the play button over that if that's really what you want. This button would be a buy button for whatever you're selling. Anyways, in the video would be like, get more information. Like if they're still not sold, watch this longer video for more information. But if you weren't ready to buy, click here, you can buy. Don't ever delay the person from buying. If they're ready to you know, give you the vagina, take it. Anyways, um, what will we cover? How to use AI in other people's content. So I really like this first point because people are enthralled with AI right now. It's like uh, tulip mania. You guys can Google that. And other people's content, folks are lazy. So when they feel like they can make money while doing nothing, that's ideal. And the second one reads a lazy way of spending less than one hour per day. I get the sentiment here. I'd probably rewrite it, but I like what they're putting forward, which is, hey, set it and forget it. It's easy. It's simple. And then right here it writes how you can start with zero dollars right now. Well, I hope that's not true. And <laughs> I hope you're about to have them pay you some money, honestly. Um, so that's number one. So that would make me suspicious, honestly. If someone says, well, get started making money with zero dollars, then my first question is like, well, how are you making money if I'm not going to pay you any money? Like, I'm, I'm getting suspicious. <laughs> now. I'm starting to yeah. want to back out because I'm like, all right, I got, I pay zero dollars, but you're going to let me make a thousand to ten thousand dollars. I'm done. Me, I'm done. But I'm not your ad average consumer of social media content and I'm not your average buyer in general. So, but me, I'm done at this point. Um, does that mean the average person is done? No, people go for all kinds of stuff, right? So let's go ahead and just click this real quick. Questions, comments so far before we carry on. Oh, for me? Yes, you. Uh, yeah, no, I appreciate the context. Actually, I think Jabrizi just recently changed the <laughs> the the thing because it, it's uh, having you set, uh, set up the email and name to get the video. Sure. So I'll, yeah, I'll so actually fix this up, but. Yeah, so almost oh. there, you submit your name and email. And now this has value to businesses. There are a number of businesses that create email lists and email lists can be sold yes. um, to third parties for significant amounts of money, especially if you guys are getting a lot of uh, a high number of emails that are accurate and within a given demographic that's of high value. So that itself could be a business. I am not going to submit my information generally, especially if I don't know what I'm going to next. But remember, you said that I already watched a 15 minute video. So at that point, I might be interested enough to submit my information. So in the absence of having actually watched the video, I won't. But if I did, maybe I would, right? But at the end of the day, um, presuming this is educational, right? Is it educational? Yeah, I actually sent the video page 
like the like the video that you'd be watching once you get the email in the chat private chat the second video. okay yeah I'm, yeah I'm not gonna go through that right now but on our next session we'll do another one of these next week let's cool. go backward and let's start with the first video that the consumer would have watched because that one's more important uh that one's more important because if that video doesn't succeed, then none of this happens. <laughs> you know no, I agree 100%. It's, it's the yeah. main image of an Amazon listing, right? Like if they don't click on your main image, then they don't even buy, right? So exactly, exactly. So yeah, let's Thank try it again next time. week. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. A pleasure. And uh, wishing both of you much success in this business venture. I'm very interested to hear about what you guys are doing. And I know you guys got some magic behind it. So looking forward to it. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Peace and saints. Absolutely. Peace, peace and saints. All right, carrying on. May I acknowledge too cool for school rights. Peace of the saints. Thanks for the tip tier life-changing advice. I appreciate that. You're very welcome and thank you for the support. None of the above one-on-one writes, uh, one of my wealth goals is to wear my own brand of clothes or any of the MDB associated brands. I have an abstract logo. I have a bit of disposable income sitting around. Okay, that's a good thing. And he says this is one of two. So let's see where the second. Okay, well, when you finish that, uh, we will post that one up. None of the above. I trust that you might be uh, typing uh, rapidly at this time. Um, uh, in the current moment, it appears someone has hit the link that was designated for Mitchell. How are you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, um, I'm just here to ask you like, about advice since you're well off with like apps and things like that, right? Um, so I just wanted to ask you advice on like monetizing the app because I'm on YouTube as well, but I wanna create an app for like sports, sports okay. app now. Okay. The problem is monetizing the thing. Yes, that's I correct. I actually have an entire course on this. I, I literally have a whole course on how to create. By the way, you got to uh, turn me down or mute me. I can hear an echo. Um, but I have an entire course. I believe it's at marquetism.com. I'll, I'll find the link and drop it in the chat for those who would like to join. And it's actually quite a unique experience in as much as most courses are pre recorded. Of course, we have a, a ton of pre recorded videos. But in addition to that, it's actually a practicum, which is to say that you participate in the learning process, almost like you're a, a work group within the actual business. And so we're creating an app and monetizing an app and going through the entire process of ideation. Uh, software development, hiring, uh, revenue model, uh, investment, pitching, the whole shebang, uh, which is what you really want and need if you're going to go into the app business. And, and I've done this many times. I'm going to drop the link. It's actually at thesassin.com. And this is an ongoing practicum. We have more than 20 uh, remaining sessions in which we do this stuff all live. You get to participate. You get to work on it. Um, so something that I highly recommend. It is the very best in education in this uh, particular endeavor. Now, did you have a particular question in terms of monetizing an application, a mobile application, or even a web application? Because I was just thinking, yes, there's ad revenue. You can monetize it through ads, but... No, no, ad revenue is rubbish. So I'll just... Uh, for those who uh, click this link and, and buy this uh, practicum, you'd be very smart. Like, for example, the gentleman is mentioning ad revenue. Ad revenue is extraordinarily difficult because, number one, it relies on user acquisition and daily active users and, and dwell time within the application. So, number one, the most important thing with software in general, uh, specifically web and mobile applications, is the revenue model. How do you make money? Most of you have mobile applications on your phone. Of the 30 to 50 applications you have on your phone, generally you have zero that you pay for, tops two or three. That being the case, um, people expect mobile apps and web applications to be completely free of cost, kind of similar to YouTube, which you're watching me on right now. YouTube, as you're mentioning, runs ads, so they get ad revenue. YouTube has over a billion users, right? And all of the technologies that utilize ads for revenue have tremendous numbers of users. So unless you, for some reason, are able to create a user base of in excess of 100,000 users straight away, ad revenue is not realistic. It won't be able to sustain you at all. So I highly recommend against that. That is not a realistic thing that might have worked maybe 20 years ago, 
um, when capital was plentiful and you know people were overly ambitious or maybe worked before the dot-com bubble. But today, investors are more savvy. They're looking to see technologies that have existing revenue models that are drawing in uh, income. And they're going to give you money based on the idea that you can you know, multiply the money and give them something back. So you have to show demonstrated success, which is sales or income revenue. So advertising is not a revenue model. And if you start a business, you should never start it with that as a revenue model, but you can always add that in once your technology become successful, which is improbable because one of the hardest things in software is acquiring users. It's extremely difficult. And one of the things we go through in this practicum is called user acquisition. This is something I've been very good at. I did software with consumer uh, technology as well as B2B. And so I know how to do this in, in various ways, but it is not easy whatsoever. So never consider um, ads as an opportunity. It's not an opportunity. It might be an add-on later. And if you ever were to pitch your idea to an investor and you use you, you speak of ads, they're not going to take you seriously. I promise you. Now, let's say I can get a number of people, let's say 100 people to use the app on a weekly basis. What's the best monetization strategy to begin well, number one, with it depends foundation. on foundation. Yeah, it depends on what your technology is. Like, for example, if you, depending on your revenue model and the price of your lead product, a hundred people could be a thousand dollars in revenue. A hundred people could be a hundred thousand dollars in revenue, or it could be $10 in revenue. You know, it depends on what your revenue model is. And that's going to be based on your technology. Uh, one of the things that I highly recommend if you uh, are to take this course right here, we actually have a section on revenue models. And even in Boston University, we have a section on revenue models. And it shows you all of the different ways you can make money within a business. You know, whether you're talking about subscription, one-time subscription, subscription, recurring subscriptions, you know, uh, premium models. There's so many different models that can be utilized. And the appropriate one is going to be defined based on the type of technology that you're utilizing. And some technologies, it doesn't make sense to use a subscription service. Like, for example, <clears throat> Uh, let's say that your mobile application is like a spreadsheet technology. It, it really wouldn't make sense to have a monthly subscription. It would be a one-time purchase, right? So the revenue model is defined based on your actual technology. That would be something we need to go on, go into, you know, one-on-one -on -one in a consultation, or you could take the course and figure this out on your own or during the course, because it's live sessions just like this with a, a smaller group of people. You can say, hey, I'm working on this technology. This is what I got. What do you guys think? What should I do? We can give you some advice then because it's perfectly in line with what we're doing. Uh, any other questions, comments before you hop off? I was just saying, uh, it's mainly a sports app. So it, it will generate mainly like people that love football, people that love sports. So yes. the marketing aspect for me is already sorted. All, all I wanted to know from you is just the best way to monetize it. And yeah, you, you, you explained that. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. I'm wishing you uh, much success with that. Yeah. Keep us posted on your success. Yeah. Are you a software Thanks. developer? Are you, are you on the tech side or the business side? No, I'm, I'm just a YouTuber. So I do like content about football. So now I want to generate oh, so an you app. Haven't started, you haven't started the app yet. You haven't started development no, yet. It, it has started develop. Now I'm, I'm just asking you the best ways to monetize gotcha. it. Well, let me tell you this. Let me give you some serious advice. Don't ever, yeah. ever, ever, ever start working on a product before you have the revenue model sealed up a good quality revenue model don't ever do that again in your life i don't care what the business is i don't care if you're producing tennis shoe laces i don't care if you're producing a sophisticated technology ai or it's a, a technology to track your period monthly i don't care what it is don't you start building before you have sealed up a revenue model it's a business it's about making money if you haven't figured out how it makes money do not start building you're wasting everything that's valuable never forget that until you know how it's going to make money, do not do anything. Fail to plan, plan to fail. You don't have a plan in place. You're building, but you don't yet have a plan. That's not good. That's not good. You're going to lose a lot of money doing things like that. I highly recommend against that. I wouldn't care if you were a billionaire. You could be a billionaire. It's still not a good idea. Thank you for joining. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, let everyone take that really, really seriously. I really do mean that. Don't you ever, ever, ever start building until you've developed a, a great revenue model, a reliable and predictable revenue model. Uh, now, I saw that the gentleman came in with his part two. He writes, I know you're not a fan of that industry, but I have the belief that I can pull it off. Yeah, and you very well can. You know, Anyone can pull it off. I just like to send people into uh, land that is fertile, most fertile, arable land, not into a, a barren desert that already has plants that are gobbling up all of the nutrients and uh, moisture in the ground, which is starved of water. He writes, shout out to Money Mitch. Also, this stream is buffering a lot. Is it my internet? I, uh, probably. It probably is your internet. Uh, if anyone else can comment on that, let me know. But I appear to be coming in crystal clear HD, bright and beautiful. And I haven't seen any buffering on my side. Uh, Elite writes, Peace of the Saints. Saint, I work in finance at Fidelity Investments, currently studying for the CFA level. Three, looking to start a private equity fund someday. Thoughts on private equity uh, slash private credit. Yeah, PE is going to require uh, good connections. You're going to need to be well networked um, and you're going to want to bring in significant amounts of revenue. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a it's an appearance game. It's a networking game. And it's a game of returns. There's a tremendous amount of fraud in that industry. You know, not to say that there's not fraud in the stock market and all these other things, but you deal with a lot of Bernie Bernie Madoffs that are you know smaller devils, and you know is not easy. And that field is more uh, more more of a people field, more personal than it is technical and high skill. But you know, it, it can be great. You can be successful at anything. And you know, one thing about PE is that you know we're talking about big numbers big amounts of money. So, you know, if you're able to win in that uh, industry, you're going to win big. But one thing I really want to caution you about is being honest, having integrity, abiding by the law, because there's a lot of scrutiny and audits in this industry. So uh, doing all of those things uh, such that you don't end up in a situation where you're on the wrong side of the law. It happens a lot with these personalities. You have a lot of people who are actually operating as a criminal, though they were raised well, they come from wealthy families, they were, you know, 100 million strong before they started their PE firm. And, you know, now they're creeping up on a billion dollars, but it turns out that it's a Ponzi scheme and they're fleecing their family members, they're fleecing strangers, then they end up in prison. This is a true story that happens all too often, um, especially in certain industries like investment banking, where there's opportunity for huge returns and there's tremendous amounts of greed. So I'm wishing you much success in that. And you will be swimming with sharks. It'll be highly competitive. There'll be you know, a lot of big boys. That, you know, There's no suckers playing around there. Uh, Christian writes, Peace of the Saints. Can anyone hop on the live to ask questions? Yeah, if you, you send in uh, your tuition as you have, you have a question, you can hop on. We'll give you about 50 seconds. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll drop the link again. Um, this is a, a show that, you know, if people support it, I guess I should say a segment that if people support it, we'll bring it back regularly. Regularly, I love to talk business. I like to see people successful and um, people get a small taste of what a consultation is like, except in a consultation, I actually like to get things done. You know, you know if you say you have a problem or you say you have an idea, you know, I'm, I'm whipping out the whiteboard, you know, I'm whipping out a piece of paper. Hey man, like uh, you're going to create an app. Great. Let's draw out the screens real quick. Let's draw out the screens after we're finished with this. Hey, uh, reach out to this contact, send them this information, tell them to whip this up in five days. And then we're going to go on to the next thing. You know, I, I like to get things done. You know, talking is fantastic. Doing is even better. Uh, my book, it is called The Black Box. You can get it on Amazon.com. Just type in The Black Box, Marquette Burton. It's rated five stars, amazingly. And uh, if you like a lower cost copy, you can go to thesassin.com and click shop, T-H-E-S-A-S-N.com. You can get it on audio or you can get it uh, as an ebook, uh, which is a little lower cost than the uh, print one. May I acknowledge Privy Landscaping. He writes, for the best game on YouTube, appreciate your time. I appreciate that. And shout out to Privy uh, Landscaping. Shout out to the Florida section. You dig? Always good to hear from those gentlemen. May I acknowledge via PayPal. Akinola writes, hello, Saint. I'm 21 years old, full-time university student, currently running a 30K a month Amazon reselling business. Congratulations. Online arbitrage wholesale model. Fair enough. Any tips slash advice for juggling growing a business while being in university? Much appreciated. Yes. Uh, and this is, you know, every business person 
is looking to figure out how to increase profitability, how to reduce the number of human beings within their business, which is to say replace that human being with technology, increase efficiency. And that's essentially what you're asking. You know, even if you weren't in university, if you're a successful businessman, you're still going to be asking yourself, well, how can I reduce burden on myself, right? How can I reduce time that I have to do fill in the blank? In fact, I was just talking with a buddy of mine, a Nigerian physician, and I was, you know, he had introduced a buddy of his who's a Nigerian plastic surgeon. And, you know, we were leaving one particular resort and, you know, the the new guy was saying, well, hey, what, what businesses are you in? I was like, I'm in this and 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 this. He's like, whoa, that's crazy. I was like, yeah, I know, I know. I, I really probably shouldn't be doing so many things. But the reality is that there's a lot of opportunities to get this money and I'm using all of them. But it takes a lot of time to learn a new business, to enter a new industry, to build new networks, to you know find a different kind of supply chain for you know a given industry. Um, increasingly, politics become involved, and I'm not talking about like politics in the colloquial sense. I'm saying in the sense of like literal, you know, like all of these wars are causing you know supply chain issues. Even with my my buck, I'm having the refrigerator replaced, and you know we ordered the refrigerator um, over two months ago. So just imagine if I was having a shipment coming from Germany, like a large shipment of product, you know, technology, hardware, it would be behind schedule and I would have problems in my business. So politics plays a major role. Um, anyways, I say that to say this, um, ideally simplicity, gentlemen, um, you know, here's what I would do differently. I'd get in one business, I'd do really well, I'd extract the cash from that business and then I would put my cash into reliable uh, paper assets, you know, reliable opportunities that's are that are reasonably liquid and allow the cash to work for me. I have always been suspicious of the stock market. I think it's a major scam for the most part. Cryptocurrency it, cryptocurrency is a scam. I think the stock market is a scam. I am certain that the cryptocurrency markets and forex are scams. Um along with NFTs etc. Um, so I've always opted rather than putting my money into the stock market, investing in the businesses of others, I've always opted to put my money into my own businesses and build the businesses. And, you know, it's worked out very well, but it takes time. And so the reality is that when you are starting new businesses, you have to invest time, you have to build the foundations, you have to create a system. And sometimes you find that the money is not worth it, you know, cause if you're a millionaire and then say you have 30 million bucks, right? And then you make 35 million bucks. Does your lifestyle change? No. If you're, um, you have $30 million and then you make $60 million, does your life change? No, there's nothing you can do as a person who has $30 million that you cannot do. Or you can like, there's nothing, excuse me. There's nothing a, a guy who has $60 million can do that a guy who has $30 million cannot do. I'll repeat that just so you guys understand what I'm saying. There is nothing that a guy who has 60 million can do, that a guy who has 30 million cannot do. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I say that to say, um, increasingly, I, I make a calculation for profit, not based on money, but based on happiness, free time, ease of the business. I like to do businesses that are an easy lift for me or businesses that I can take joy in. So that's just some long-term advice for the young men out there. Um, I wouldn't get a side hustle. This is all nonsense. I do really well at one thing and I would take the cash and I would drop the cash in a number of different industries and allow the cash to work for me. Um, let me uh, uh, allow the saying on. Um, he has something to say. Give him the 50 seconds. Peace of the saints. Saints. Peace of the saints. Talk. All right, all right. Um, number one, thank you for letting me on. I, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate what well, you're doing. You've been going crazy the last like couple of days with the lives, and honestly, I'm glad I could catch you on. Uh, so I got two questions for you. Um, so right now, I'm working in the HVAC industry, which is air conditioning down here in well, South Florida. I know you're not too strong on well, service well. industries. Say, excuse me. No, I said that's a great place for for air conditioning. South Florida, it, it's perfect. It, 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 <laughs> exactly, it's it's all year round. So, um, I've been in the industry a long time. My dad has an H, HVAC company. He ended up uh, getting sick, not being able to continue it. Um, I started managing it. I realized I didn't know shit. Um, so I started working with uh, 
two of the biggest AC companies down here in South Florida that basically gobble up all the small ones. Um, just to see how the infrastructure runs. Anyways, uh, I'm getting to the point where I feel sufficient enough to just go all in and, and just say, fuck it and just go forward and commit everything to the business. But I, I really wanted your perspective on what should I have just to make that jump? Because right now, of course, I'm, I'm building that, that, that base foundation when it comes to income for the marketing, for um, hiring individuals, whether that's part-time or as a contract. That's the first question. And secondly, uh, with minimum income, minimal revenue, what would be a wise marketing strategy? Okay. So first off, do you have any siblings? Uh, yes, I do. I have a younger brother, older sister. Okay. What's your age and what are their ages? Uh, I'm 25, sister's 27, little brothers. He's about to graduate high school, so 17. Okay. Got you. And how long, how many years ago was it that your father stopped running his uh, HVAC business? So he stopped running it uh, two years ago. And then I started managing it, uh, went to get my license at school. That took uh, around eight months to get, and then started working in the industry. Been working in the industry for around, I'd say, like six to eight months. So okay. a little bit less than two years is when, when he got sick. When you got out of high school, did you go into university? What did you do the first couple of years out of high school? So the first couple of years out of high school, I... I just went into marketing and IT work. Um, I went into college. I didn't finish college. I do basically went for engineering, uh, didn't finish that. Went into doing marketing for a big company down here in Miami. And up. I'm going to catch you off a number of times just so that we can rush through um, yep. so we can uh, get to where we need to go. And just for everyone, uh, remember that when you're in business, you're going to be cut off a lot. Like if you're in real business, you're going to be cut off a thousand times, especially by, you know, your bosses. You know, when you're okay. in certain industries like education, you know, they're, they're nice, they're pleasant in business. You're dealing with sharks. People don't care. They want to, you know, get after it. So just heads up politely. I'm going to cut you off a bunch of times. So I'm just going to right now say, I'm sorry. Now, Okay. So why, when you were coming out of high school, didn't you say, hey, I want to run dad's HVAC business? So that, that's honestly an, an amazing question. Um, Thank you. The, the, <laughs> so really, the, it, it, there was something that distract, detracted me from it because of how I seen my dad run the company and he just wasn't he just wasn't for hiring individuals um he really just wanted to take care of the family which i i, I love him for to this day um putting a house over our head and make sure everyone's okay you're saying he wasn't expanding the business or he, he wasn't uh, exactly okay so you didn't like the way he was running the business so yeah i, I didn't like the way he was running the business I, jack i would try to uh help him manage it to help him do other things to market and expand it but um it wasn't there, there was just a lot of like back and forth dissonance and it, it just wasn't working out. Um, so, so that, that was really what, what kind of kept me away from it. And, and a okay. so, couple of things. So number one, one thing you need to be suspicious of yourself is uh, number one, I got a father who's a, an entrepreneur you know, and there are levels to all things, but he's an entrepreneur. He's running a business. I had a, a clear shot at going straight into that. Now, granted, young people don't know anything about the world or the importance of earning an income or the difficulty of getting a job and maintaining a career and income. So I get that. But that's one thing you need to be suspicious about is like, do, am I really interested in running a business and or am I really interested in the HVAC industry in particular? That's one thing to consider. Questions for yourself. Secondly, with regards to the HVAC industry in South Florida, I think it's a perfect fit. There, there are very few fits that are that damn good. You have to run AC year round. If it breaks, people are going to need it fixed. Mm -hmm. One business question I would have for myself if I were you is, what is the most common service needed in my industry? Like, for example, if you were to open up a car mechanic shop, there are a number of things that a car mechanic can do. They can fix your brakes. They can change your oil. They can, you know, install new parts. They can change your tires. They can rotate. the. They can do a thousand different things. 
But you should ask yourself, I'm just getting started. What's the most common service? If the most common service is oil changes, for example, rather than opening an entire mechanic shop, you would just open a shop that only does oil changes because it's the most common service. You know, you will always be able to get paid if you are doing exclusively oil changes. You can become a master of that. So that's number one for you. Mm -hmm. Secondly, once you've identified what that most common service required is in your industry, I would ask myself, what is the infrastructure that is required to deliver that service? The tools that I need, the spare parts that I need, uh, do I need a van? What do I have to transport? How many persons can do it? Can I do it myself? If you can do it yourself, that's ideal to start with. So then I would figure out what those costs are. Marketing is not necessary. Marketing follows sales. So once you get some sales, then you'll consider marketing. Um, so marketing is a farther off conversation. Brand is a farther off conversation. So I would start with those simple basics. And once you figure those things out, then you go on to the other things. Business is a, it's a real ball game and you're going to suffer if you're trying to figure out or do too many things at once. So the simple thing, number one, is what is the most common service that is required in your industry? Do you know the answer to that right now? Yeah. So, so it's really top two is, AC is getting clogged, therefore cutting off the system because they have a shut off valve and people think the AC is broken. It just needs to be unclogged. And then two, AC breaks down. They just need a new system. So I think the most lucrative is new system. They need an entire system. Exactly. Okay. Which is easier to fix? I heard you say one is more lucrative, but which is easier to fix? Easier to fix is the, the drain line, of course. Simple 30-minute job companies charge like two to 300 bucks coming out to got it so and which one requires less equipment definitely the unclogging the drain line and servicing the unit like that great so if i were you i would start the business and i would focus exclusively on being able to send out a serviceman to unclog the drain line if something else is required i'd have a serviceman who can identify what is required oh you need to have your entire unit uh replaced even if you guys don't have the capacity to replace it due to finances personnel what have you i would have a partner that you can pass off the contract to and then take a percentage right you know as soon as you figure out that that whole unit needs to be replaced oh yeah we're going to refer you to our partners and it's such and such you pass off the contract to them you take you know five percent as a finder's fee and then you carry on with your core business until you have the capacity to do the other things you have any other questions comments before we uh carry on uh La, uh, relating to my first one, yes. Uh, so, like I said, right now I'm getting to the point where I, I've seen some infrastructure with these companies that work, different uh, areas, whether that's service, installing, um, a little bit in the office to see how's it, how it goes. Um, right now I feel like I'm getting to the point where I kind of want to just say, fuck it and basically leave that and go and focus on this full time. I'm wondering... It, it's, is there any safety nets I should put for myself or do you still live with your parents? Right. Right now. Yes. Okay. So there's a good safety net. Number one and yeah. number two, um, look into what we're talking about in terms of what the most common service is and how much is it going to cost you to be able to execute that most common service. And that's going to let you know the kind of capital that you require to get this business off of the ground. You don't need to calculate what it's going to cost you to market because you don't need to market yet. <laughs> Um, and you, there are a lot of ways to market or reach the customer organically. Um, and I don't know if you're in a part of any particular ethnic community in South Florida, of which there yeah. are many, you know, Haitians and so on and so forth, but are you Haitian or anything like this? Yeah. Yes, sir. Great. So, you know, just based on ethnic communities, that's going to allow you to access a certain customer base more effectively. Right. So. You know, these are the kind of things that I would try to utilize to access customer base without like formally marketing. Um, so you have a great customer, uh, you have a great safety net. You live with your parents and they're probably not going to kick you out. You seem like a good guy to me. So they're probably not going to kick you out. Um, you know, you probably don't live with a, a super ghetto black mom. Like you 18, you gotta go, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you got a great safety net. You just need to ca uh, calculate what your expenses are going to be to get started. And what I would advise you to do is to actually get started while still working at the current place that you do work at. It's been a pleasure to meet you, Christian. Thank you for these questions until next time. Peace to the saints. Peace to the saints. Gravity Films writes, what is the best way to find a good web application developer at low cost? Word of mouth. 
Word of mouth is the best way. And the reason that I say word of mouth is because you can find many web developers at low cost, but uh, they're probably not good. It's kind of like, as they say about tattoos, mind you, I don't have any tattoos, but they say good tattoos aren't cheap and cheap tattoos aren't good. Lord Jesus. Ain't that crazy? Wow, most thick woman. She was slim thick, slim thick, amazing. Shout out to my location. Anyways, yeah, so good tattoos aren't cheap. Cheap tattoos aren't good. The same thing is true in web development. Um, you're going to have to spend some amount of money, but you can get better deals. Bad deals are in the West, uh, United States, Australia, uh, much of Western Europe. Uh, the good deals are in Eastern Europe. Ukraine used to be a, a primary provider of quality uh, web development. The cheapest developers are in Pakistan, India, and uh, you know parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is not well regarded for their developers. Indian developers generally do not do a great job unless you're paying like a tremendous amount of money for very select premium firms, of which there are very few in India. Um, I really would avoid uh, using an Indi Indian or Pakistani firm in general. Uh, I've seen good work come out of uh, the Philippines, um, but ideally you would be in dealing with developers in Eastern Europe. So which is the best way to find a good web, web developer? Word of mouth, number one. Number two, using the rating systems on things like Fiverr or Upwork, uh, looking at the ratings and then selecting the people according to their uh, countries. I'm talking about Ukraine, Bulgaria, uh, Latvia, uh, low-income Eastern European countries are generally good opportunities. Thank you for that question. Ray writes, peace to the saints. First time paying tuition. Truly appreciate you, Ray. I see you right here. Uh, go ahead. Talk to me, boss. I can't hear you. I, I don't think anyone else can hear you either. Oh, yeah. And by the way, folks, get the likes up. I, I don't think there's anyone else who actually has business experience who gives a, a proper business show such as this. I think I can Testing hear you now. Yes, my we hear you. For so my name is Ray Line Franco. I'm a full stack web developer, entirely self-taught. I'm currently Hello. running a business called Victory Rush. Um, it's entirely web design for the moment, but I'm looking to pivot into doing SaaS products. Now, you said you're running I'm, also, I'm sorry? You, you have to talk just a, a touch slower. Um, primarily for the audience, you know, primarily for the audience to understand, uh, you know, what you have to offer. Uh, you said you were running a course, did you? No, I'm a full stack web developer and I'm currently running a web design business. Ah, thank you. Carry on. So I'm currently looking to pivot over into SaaS products and developing applications for people. I work primarily in React, Angular, Firebase, the, the entire gamut. What I was wondering is whether it's better to stick with web design because it brings in the, the cash faster. However, SaaS products would net a higher profit margin. For example, if I can charge maybe $5,000 to $15,000 for a SaaS application versus a $3,000 website, do you think that it's better to go long term with SaaS applications as a solo developer as opposed to a web designer? So number one, anytime you want to grow your wealth, there's service-based business and product-based business. And let's differentiate it. We'll, we'll, in this case, since we're talking software, we'll say doing the job yourself or hiring others to do the job, right? So you're, there are two considerations. You mentioned one, which is speed of the income, and then the other one is size of the income. I think that one of the beautiful things is that if you do have that capacity and I would always like try to figure out like who I can hire. And I know a number of folks who are essentially middlemen because, you know, the Indian project managers are Indian. They speak with accents. You know, there's some things about American design and culture or just Western design and culture that they're not really keen on. And as a result, um, they're not going to do well at interfacing directly with the customer, but they're proficient web developers. Their, their iOS development is atrocious. Their Android development is respectable. But I say that to say this. Say, and you're one man, we know that development takes a lot of time and work. Oh, yes. Yes, so re if, you, if you get a good contract, either A, it's going to take you a long time. And when I say good, I mean high ticket. It's going to take you a long time if you're doing it by yourself. Which, And realistically, if it's a significant contract, you're not going to be doing it by yourself. You're going to need somebody to help you. 
<laughs> right? And so there's nothing wrong with, you know, one thing I think is great. You already have a business going in design and I, and I trust you to be a designer. I'll tell you why. Like I'm looking at your setup right now. I see you got the black and the gray and the white. You know, you look sharp. Everything's well centered. Like you, you're a guy who has style and design and design is it, it's hard to find a good designer. It's like, oh, my Lord, because design requires skill and taste. You can teach skill. You cannot teach taste. Either you have it or you don't have it. So being a good designer, you could also be in the premium market for design as well. And you know that like you can earn more money as a designer. However, one thing I think is going to be a good opportunity for you is upselling your design clients. That's number one. So upselling your de design clients and taking on the development side too, because generally we both know this, you, you find a decent developer that's well-priced. They're atrocious at design. So <laughs> yes. it's, it's always the case. They're, they're atrocious. They, they either can't do it at all, or they're really bad at it. So if you're a designer who can also do development, it's easy for you to do the upsell or more intelligently, you'd go the other route and then you can partner with developers and have them bring you on to do the design. And they kind of like, you know, add that contract in for you. There's a lot of ways to increase the number of contracts that you're getting. That's number one. Then number two, if you actually want to go the development route, if I were you, what I would probably do realistically is I would start the marketing on the development side. I would get a high quality Indian firm, low cost, high quality, relatively speaking, right? And we know that Indian firms are doing things for cents on the dollar, right? If, if you would have passed this contract off to a Western firm, they're going to charge you 100,000. You pass it off to an Indian firm, they're going to charge you 14,000. There's a big gap there in which you make money in this gap. So if I were you, I would go on Fiverr, Upwork, et cetera. I would list my development firm. I would say that it's based in, are you based in the United States? Yes, Dallas. Perfect. I would list Dallas, Texas. My firm is based in Dallas, Texas. I would hire all Indian uh, developers, you know, across the gambit, whatever technologies are most appealing or popular. And then I would be essentially a project manager and CEO when really I'm just like subcontracting to them. And I think that's what a lot of folks are actually doing. Your true job is being that you're actually technical is that you can seriously vet these folks and make sure that they're doing good work and they're timely and honest. And then you just interface with the Western consumer of, you know, the development uh, product. That's what I would do. If you think that you're going to be the one doing the development, you get a good contract. You're not going to be able to deliver it yourself. Um, I would just use my skills to actually supplement what they're doing. I actually would not be the core developer because ideally this is what you want in business. You want a lot of clients, right? So it would be nonsense. It would be completely foolish for you to actually start developing. And this is why often when I meet people who are more on the lay side or like uh, imbeciles on YouTube, they're like, do you know how to develop technology? Do you know how to develop software? I'm like, I am pretty bad at Ruby on Rails, which shows you when I started studying development. A long <laughs> it's been a while. Time. Yeah, it's been a long time. But I was smart enough to figure out that if I was actually spending my time coding, I wasn't really getting paid at the high level. Like Steve Jobs is not a coder and that's smart of him. Yeah. There's a reason we know him. Very few, not to say that Steve Wozniak is not a genius and he's not well off, but you get the point. Your job really, if you want to make the big bucks is to subcontract, use your technical skills to make sure that they're actually delivering on time quality work and they're actually doing the work and then to get as many contracts as possible. That's your true job, getting Boss contracts, talk, being man. a marketer. Boss talk. Thank you very yeah. much for this insight. And I wanted to thank you for writing the black box. I personally come from the South Bronx, one of the ghettos of New York City. And yes, it's sir. tremendous to see someone in your position, brother. True. I appreciate that. Thank that you. means a lot. And tell us where we can find your design work at. So it's raylanfran.co. R-A-Y-L-A-N-F-R-A-N so dot C-O. Yes, that's correct. Awesome. Next time you come on here, put that on your uh, your name. Most definitely, brother. Talk to you yeah. soon. How's it going? <laughs> Absolutely. Peace to the saints. Peace to the saints. And, you know, I wasn't trying to just support the gentleman's business just because. Um, I, I surmise he's probably a good uh, designer, and good design is hard to find. Ooh, I'm telling you, good design is hard to find. <laughs> so check him out. If he's good, put him to work. Darius writes, more quet. Tomorrow is All Saints Day. Peace to the saints. Oh, indeed. He writes, props to your legendary Kevin Samuels live stream. Yeah, yeah. Last night, that was wild. Shout out to the people who were a part of that. Um, that it was like five hours and like 
20 minutes. Uh, that one's going to be going up uh, today, actually. So keep your eyes out. Shout out to Montrell. He writes question in the chat saying thank you in advance. All right, let's see what he has. I believe it is here. Montrell writes, Peace of the Saints, many students are using ChatGPT to complete assignments and avoid basic plagiarism detection systems. I don't know how well that actually works. Uh, what do you think of building a technology to sell to schools to detect chat GPT use? I would never want to sell to schools. This is as someone who has done well in a business that sells to schools. I would not want to sell to schools because schools generally do not believe that they have money, especially if they're a public school. We're even talking about public universities included. So ideally, you don't sell to schools. If you must sell to schools, you'd want to sell to private schools because the sales cycle will be shorter and they feel like they're more liquid. They have money to spend. After all, they're charging tuition. But the sad reality about schools, whether you're at the primary, secondary or tertiary level, is that schools strangely operate differently. So it's quite difficult when you're building a business around selling to schools is like who to reach out to. For example, I ran a major corporation that sold to universities and we did big deals. It was very exciting stuff. Um, and it was a high growth company. One thing that we were challenged with is we were in the student retention space initially. At one university, the person is called the head of student retention. At another university, the person is called the head of first year experience. At another university, the person is called the student success manager. They all do the same job, right? And so it's hard when you're training up your staff and creating a systematic approach or even using a web scraper technology to scrape the job titles, emails, and names to blast out emails through you know, a marketing effort. It's quite difficult. I would avoid selling the schools. It is just not the best that's not a fertile field. <laughs> you hear me? Uh, I would avoid it. By the way, shout out to the ballers. Christian came through, and this is the gentleman who was just recently on the live. Our Haitian brother, shout out to the Zoes. He writes, peace to the saints indeed, peace to the saints. Shout out to the folks in the South Florida section. Key writes, can I come on? Of course you can come on. Uh, go ahead and hit the link. I'll drop it in there if you need the link again. Okay, so that one is for Key, who just came in with the support. Go ahead and hit that link, and we'll get after it. And one thing I want you guys to be aware of, I know you were probably taught to take turns and to be nice and not, not cut people off. If you're working within a high-growth startup, high-growth technology company, a traditional corporation, um, people are going to cut you off. I absolutely <laughs> promise you they're going to cut you off, okay? So... Um, you know, it just is what it is, especially people who are above you in the hierarchy, you know, don't take offense to it. Um, realize it's business culture, learn how to speak concisely and effectively. Um, I'm not calling out anyone. I'm just letting you guys know what to expect and what you're going to have to do as a leader. Cause you just, time is limited and money is not limited. So let's get after this money. Hit me. Hello. My name is Keyshawn Billups, but I want to start off saying I produce some SaaS and products under you, as you may know. So I wanted to know, how do I file it on my taxes? Like, I just looked at it as an investment opportunity. So how do I do that? Okay. So number one, let me tell everyone, I am not an, I am not an accountant. I am not an accountant. I want everyone, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a tax preparer. I'm not a bookkeeper. I want everyone to know that. Um, in fact, I am not giving any paid uh, legal or financial advice during this stream or any other stream that I've ever done. <laughs> number one. Now, the important thing with taxes is that you have tax, you can be taxed on a number of different levels. Uh, the key is to have a tax advisor who is in your locality, ideally in your municipality, such that they can help you with a tax strategy that respects your local regulations, laws, et cetera, and is going to be best for you. And it's someone you can actually see face to face. I don't think you live in Las Vegas, right? No, Elena. All right. So, you know, even if I was an actual tax preparer, tax advisor, accountant, I still wouldn't be able to give you the best tax advice. So my recommendation is there are certain things that you don't want to mess up. There are two things that are critical in business. Number one, especially if you're planning to make like many millions of dollars, like for example, when you're going to create a corporation, let's say it's going to be a tech corporation and you plan to make many millions in profit, 
This means generally you're going to need a significant number of investors. Being that you need a significant number of investors, you're going to have to have a corporation that allows for shares and you need to authorize a high number of shares. Selecting the correct legal entity is critical. That doesn't take a lot of science. You're usually going to use a C corporation. Some people use an LLC. It can work. I don't recommend it. You can use an LLC and elect to be taxed as an S corporation. It's fine. But here's the challenge. Sometimes people try to do their own paperwork when they're organizing a legal entity. This is something you do not want to ever mess up. You want to hire an attorney to organize your C corporation to authorize the appropriate amount of shares such that you are well positioned to take on investors. So that's one thing you never want to compromise. You never want to mess up. You have to use a legal expert in the right industry, a business lawyer, ideally that works with startups, tech startups. So that's number one. Then the second thing is with regards to taxes. And also when you get a good tax advisor, accountant, what have you, you want them to do your personal taxes and your business taxes. You want to go to the same individual, which means you're not going to have one firm do your business taxes and then do your personal taxes on TurboTax.com. That would not make sense. Uh, generally speaking, having the same person do your personal and business taxes will be to your benefit because they have a greater wealth of information to save you money. And there are a lot of uh, favors that they can grant you. There are a lot of things that you can take as expenses that'll be to your advantage. So what I would recommend is that you have a conversation with a tax advisor in Atlanta. You start the conversation in writing on email requesting the, you know, hey, you know, I have this product, I've made this much money, or I've invested this much money. And what do you recommend I do in terms of being taxed? Would you recommend I'm taxed as a sole proprietor? I'm which is like an individual, would you recommend I have an LLC? Now, mind you, these people don't know. Shh. Once they give you a, a recommendation, come back. Let's have another conversation about it. But ask them, well, which way do you recommend I be taxed for what I'm doing? In some cases, they might say, oh, hey, like you haven't really done anything yet. You don't need to worry about this yet. So that's why I say come back. Let's have a conversation because if they say, oh, you need to open an LLC and you need to do this and do this and do that, might not be true. And I want to advise everyone, generally people want to open up a, a legal entity uh, too early. You usually don't want to open up a legal entity until you're receiving significant income, uh, significant income. Then you open up a legal entity. Why? Because it's expensive to do so correctly. And number because LLCs you can do yourself, but we're talking about many millions. LLCs are kind of out of the window. LLCs are great for real estate. They're not great for tech companies, even though I do believe you, uh, YouTube uniquely is an LLC. So that's number one. Until you're making significant amounts of income, then you want to organize a legal entity. You want to have a lawyer do it. You want to have appropriately authorized shares, presuming that you're planning to take on investors in this company, which will help it scale and grow if it's appropriate. Um, what else? Yeah, I think those are the main things. Generally, you don't want to do that too early. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Um, okay, I might have a job opportunity in King Prussia, Pennsylvania. Oh. Or Fort yeah, Worth, Texas. Yeah, there's a huge Any, mall in King of Prussia. Any thoughts on it for women? Okay, like, yeah. So you, you got King of Prussia or Dallas, Texas, you said? Fort Worth. Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. I'd let's look at a map real quick and see exactly where Fort Worth is. Just give me a moment. I've actually been to King of Prussia many times. Had a super turbo thick cougar and redhead cougar in King of Prussia. Enormous mall. You know, malls always have the the Fifi's there. Well, let's let's see exactly where King, uh, excuse me, where Fort Worth is, and I want to see what it's near. I, I think, generally speaking, uh, Texas is a better destination for business. Uh, King of Prussia is just like a bit out of the way, honestly. Let's share okay. screen. Here's Fort Worth. Okay, so we're going to zoom out. Oh, we don't need to zoom out. Fort Worth is right next to Dallas. Dallas is a major hub. I'd probably go to Dallas because I think the opportunities will be better there because you're using lily pads, right? You show up in one place, you see what you can do, what kind of money you can extract, network. Oh, you met another guy. He needs a developer. Boom. Let me join your company. Also, I believe Texas is a place where Tesla is adding some uh, a campus. And so, you know, you might run into someone who is high up at Texas, uh, Tesla or the box company, and then you can easily transition 
So those are the kind of opportunities I think will be more plentiful in a place like Dallas as opposed to King of Prussia. And I've been to King of Prussia, so I'm speaking from experience. Uh, and the only thing I really remember from King of Prussia is, as I said, huge mall and also a super thick redhead cougar who by now is like probably like, you know, really old because I met her like a very long time ago. Anyways, so King of Prussia. Um, closest city is Philadelphia. I actually used to live in Philadelphia. I find Philadelphia to be a bit of a dying city. You know, not much is popping off in Philly. Um, so, and just, uh, for your information, let's look at the distance from King of Prussia mall to the heart of Philadelphia. Not bad, about 30 minutes, not bad. So you wouldn't be terribly far. So they're not Neither of them are atrocious opportunities. They're both reasonable opportunities and cost of living in King of Prussia is going to be very, very reasonable. Um, I forget what city you're in, um, but the winters obviously will be a factor because you'll be getting snow here, whereas I don't think that Fort Worth is snowing. Um, so that depends on your personal preference. But generally, I think the much better opportunity is in Fort Worth. Like if it were me, I would do Fort Worth hands down easy. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. All good? Yeah, yeah. All right, peace to the saints. Peace to the saints. All right, let's see where we are. RJ writes, how would you go about growing an e-commerce agency? So let's see what he means by agency. I, myself, am what they call a computer whiz, okay? But now I find myself unable to find time to grow clients slash employees. Okay. Big fan to own an I8 Roadster myself. Shout out. You know, the I8 Roadster was discontinued, which definitely is going to add to its long-term value and especially the sellability um, when it becomes like a, you know, a real classic. You know, BMW did us a favor, many favors. Number one, it's the most expensive car that they put in uh, market that year. Number two, it has non-standard doors. It was like the first hybrid exotic. So there are a lot of favors they did us in terms of that resale value being very stable. So I'm looking forward to that. It's one of those cars that I have that I don't plan on selling. Every now and then I'll sell some cars. I sold one of my Rolls Royce, um, but that one I don't think I will sell. Now, how would you go about growing an e-commerce agency? So, so the question is, number one, do you already have an e-commerce agency? Uh, that's number one. And then number two, I always like to step away from jargon. So what precisely do you mean when you say e-commerce agency? And uh, number two, when you say you're having trouble growing clients and employees, well, ideally, you don't want to increase the number of employees if you don't have to. You want to increase reliance on uh, technology, algorithms, uh, processes, systems. You don't want to increase the number of employees as a major expense. Um, and then also it creates greater inefficiency because human beings are flawed and imperfect increasing clients you certainly want to increase clients either you want to increase a uh, number of clients or you want to increase the depth in which you go with a given client which is to say increase the profitability of a given uh, customer relationship so if you can answer those for me we can go in a little bit deeper um and, and shout out to the, the the cats and the the cool whips you dig i acknowledge via paypal Biko writes Biko. oh by the way shout out to the ballers Biko came in with the baller alert he writes Biko always cooking. That'd be funny if he's actually a chef. <laughs> Truly appreciate it. Shout out to those uh, supporting the work. Bro said always cooking. He's come in saying that a couple times. So I'll give the Saint uh, RJ a, a little bit of time to uh, clarify that, and then we'll we'll go there. Mohammed writes, HVAC businesses are so good. You're so lucky. Uh, very few of us are lucky. Here, <laughs> very few of us are lucky. You know, we're mostly gonna have to work to get what we got. But I tell you, there's no better a match between a business than South Florida and the HVAC business. It's hot year round. It's excuse me, it's humid year round. People are gonna want that to work year round. Um, and you're in a country and a, a local economy that's very cash rich. So it's just a match made in heaven. If you if you can't do that business there, you can't do it anyway. I'll give you guys a little bit of time to send your comments, questions, tuition as we wind down. It's been a pleasure to have you all uh, with me. And uh, shout to Montreal supporting the work came in by a cash app. Uh, and if you guys like this segment, uh, 
will continue on. Seems like it's you know reasonably uh, well supported, and people are coming in with uh, engaging questions. Okay, looks like Montreal came back. How much would one need to initially invest in a product-based business to generate a modest return? I'm in the process of finishing my MBA and I would like to start my own business without debt. I don't recommend you ever use debt to do any business. There's so many opportunities uh, that are so many resources, opportunities, people, uh, strategies that can be leveraged to build a business without debt. That is out. Like that is, I would never recommend anyone take on debt to build a business. I don't care how much of a sure shot it is. That's a ludicrous concept. Anytime anyone mentions like using a credit card or using debt or loans to build a business, this is foolishness. You're talking to a, a novice. You're talking to someone who's not tried and true. Highly recommend against that in all cases. That's number one. Number two, uh, how much does it cost to start a product-based business? It depends on the product. You could start a product-based business for less than five hundred dollars. I I literally have an educational video that you can get. I think it's at thesassin.com. Once you click shop, t h e s a s n dot com, or it's at marquetism dot com, and it, the lesson reads how to start a product-based business for five hundred dollars or less. So you can do that, and there are levels to all things, and this is what I mean. So, for example, this product right here, which is a phenomenal product, um, this is sold out. You can get this at, uh, you can get the black version, actually. It's a full leather uh, backpack briefcase, gorgeous piece, high quality. This one's over two years old, and it still looks brand new. Uh, you can get the black on black version, which I also have two of those, um, at mdblabel.com. And I highly recommend it. Shout out to Fresh and Fit. They both copped them. And someone actually copped one this morning uh, that I just happened to notice. So, you know, boss up. And remember, once they're sold out, they're all gone. We'll never sell them again. I like my products to be, you know, pieces that are going to appreciate with value and they're going to appreciate because of scarcity. So I don't make more of them. It's done. Once you got it, you got it. You're a boss. There will never be any more. Anyways, um, the reason I point that out, that product out is because of this. The initial order on that product uh, for me to get my bulk order, I think it was around like $33,000 I had to spend cash. $33,000 in cash I sent over uh, to my manufacturer to produce that. So $33,000 you had to have to get that business started. And it's a luxury product. Um, I forget exactly what it's retailing at. It's retailing well under market value because there's nothing like it on the market. But the fact is, it's a luxury product. It's an expensive product to make. It's full, genuine leather. It's handmade, custom design. It has a, a gun holster inside. It has a number. It has a secret compartment inside. It has all of these special things, and it's just a beautiful, high quality piece. I mean, this one's two years old and it looks pristine. So that's expensive. Conversely, if you were to do a, a simple product, you know there there are levels to things. Like you could make an iPhone charger with an extra long cord. That's your special contribution. That's your unique value add. This is an iPhone charger with a really long cord, or this is the world's most durable iPhone charger. It'll last you an entire lifetime and you use a different material to wrap the cord in so that it doesn't fray like the Apple chargers. There's a, an infinite number of uh, products you can do, like backpack briefcase. I sent $33,000 just to get started. Um, this one, this is a product that St. Flo's did, and he was able to you know, come by this product by being a member uh, at patreon.com slash the St. The Center. Periodically, I give great opportunities to people to uh, you know, become entrepreneurs with products that I've already designed. I've already vetted it, selected the manufacturer, went through the prototyping process. And St. Flo's is an ambitious young man. You actually can get this at uh, mdblabel.com. He was smart enough to create a business card for it. And he has the QR code so that once you buy his product, if someone's like, yo, that watch is cold, and many people will. Um, I actually already have one. I bought another one because it's that cold. I want two of them. <laughs> you dig? Um, but if someone likes it, then you can tell them, oh, you know, here, scan this. You want to get it? And then they can cop it. All the money goes to him. You can get this one at mdblabel.com. It's a beautiful, oh my God, it's a beautiful piece. Actually, it's it's wrapped right now so that when it's shipped, that it doesn't get like one single scratch on it. So I got to take all of this protection off of it. And even with the protection on it, you can see how gorgeous it looks. Um, his initial investment on this one, I don't recall what it was, but it was much less than $33,000. And the profit margins on this product and jewelry products in general are excellent. Uh, 
If you're a member at patreon.com slash the Saint the Center, uh, if you just go back, um, you can check the the uh, product based opportunity uh, product based business opportunities and it'll show you what the initial investment was just to get a sense of the different uh, levels of cost um, that you can uh, embrace for certain opportunities and certain levels of profitability. So yeah, there are products that you can do that wouldn't cost you more than 500 US dollars. They would cost you that amount or less. So it just depends on which product you're doing. I usually recommend people do products that are simple and products that they fundamentally understand. And when I say a product that you fundamentally understand, uh, what I mean is that you know it, it wouldn't be wise for you to come out of nowhere with no technical background and say, hey, Mark, I want to build a mobile application by myself. Well, you don't have the expertise to do that. You need a lot of help. Taking the practicum course would help you, but trying to do it on your own would be unrealistic. And when you also, another thing, when you do a product, I want you to do a product you fundamentally understand. And when I say that, like, for example, um, you guys have all worn a watch. You fundamentally understand watches. Watches are not complex or sophisticated. You understand. You get it. So you want to do a product that you use, right? Because when you go through the testing or prototyping phase, you want to use the product and figure out what can be improved about it or you know, if it's high quality and durable. So for example, if you wanted to sell soccer cleats, but you don't play soccer, you'd be very unwise to go ahead and, uh, you know, get a soccer cleat sample. Now, how are you going to test the sample if it's durable? You can't because you don't play soccer, right? So just like myself, the reason my boxing shoe design is excellent is because I box. I don't only box, train boxing, I also fight. And I go through a lot of boxing shoes. And I've went through boxing shoes from the Fila company, the Adidas company, the Nike company, the Reebok company. And I've went through uh, shoes at all price tiers. So I knew what the market lacked. And being that I'm a practitioner of that particular sport, I could really put the shoes to the test because it was something that I fundamentally understood. So I always encourage people to use products or should me to produce products to start with that you fundamentally understand. For example, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for me to produce a shampoo. Ah, I don't really use shampoo like that. You dig? So I wouldn't even be able to test the quality or to, you know, advise my manufacturer on how to improve it. You know, these are basics, but often, you know, people get pitched on an idea and they try to do something that's out of their league. You, you don't want to do that. So thank you for that question. Um, so if you haven't checked out that footage, I highly recommend you check out that footage. If you already have an idea that that's fantastic, we can work, work with that. And so if you already have an idea, I'd advise you to book a consultation at markquedism.com. And whether you have one idea or multiple ideas, you, you show up, Hey, Hey, Qued, uh, I got these ideas. Let me run them by you. Tell me which one you think is most likely to catch fire. You know, you run your three ideas. I say, Oh, this one, eh, not so good. That one's terrible. This one, it's a winner. Let's talk about it. And then we're going to dig in deep and figure out how do we actually pause? How do we actually get this thing to market as quickly as possible and start turning over a dollar? Your education as an MBA, and, and I'm quite familiar with what you're taught because I've lectured to MBA students at top universities. And I've been, I didn't just show up there to lecture for free. You heard me, I was invited in as an expert and I was paid to lecture at top universities. That's a major difference between me and these other psychopaths. Um, so, oh, and remember the beautiful thing about this one is that you can actually adjust it such that it fits your wrist perfectly. So that's a beautiful thing. It comes with a small adjustment tool. I'm actually gonna adjust this one right now. Um, but yeah, the MBA is, usually teaches you how to manage a developed business. And so it doesn't teach you the, the skills and strategies that are necessary to, to build a business from scratch. Um, that's where I come in. That's why they invite guys like me to come in and to, to teach. Oh man, this thing is clean as hell. This is dope. Just the cleanliness of it. Like, hold on. It's ridiculous. It's like, look at that. This is the cleanliness of it, yo. This is cool. MDBlabel.com, log in, boss up. And mind you, I don't make a penny. If you go on and buy this right now, Marquette Devon Burton does not make a penny. That's love. Find someone who loves you like that, where they promote your products so that you can earn well. Marquette Devon Burton does not make a penny if you go and buy this, but it's a great product that I stand by and that I use. Um, so... I'm sharing this with you and it'll benefit St. Flo's. And he's a good brother. He's a real gentleman, class act. He came by Sasson headquarters to deliver this to me after I purchased it. And I do buy your products. You know, if you make a product that I can use, I'm going to buy it. I might buy it once or twice uh, or even three times. You know, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to help you guys. Um, and he, you know, I purchased it and he came by Sasson headquarters and, and my mother was actually here. You know, he's very kind uh, uh, to my mother. 
And he's just a real classy gentleman. So do support him. Um, thank you for that question. Carrying on. Okay, I see that uh, Jonathan sent in a cash app. He has a, a question here. He writes, does it make sense to start your first product-based business with apparel? Does it make sense? Yeah, it can make sense. Yes. Uh, I want to add a feature to the apparel that is not just design. Okay. And he writes, may I come on? Uh, yes, you may. So uh, I'll drop the link again um, for you to come online and you'll have about 50 seconds to uh, you know, share your question or comment and you know, we'll work through it, see what kind of value we can offer you uh, within that amount of time. So here is the link. All right, so we'll give you a little bit of time to come on. And in the meantime, we will address Mr. Whitley. He writes, Peace of the Saints. Just tuned into this live. I would like to join the live stream and demo the platform that I've developed if possible. Yeah, sure. We generally give people about 50 seconds, so do be aware of that. And number two, do be aware that I'll be cutting you off and going really fast. Uh, but yes, I, I would love for you to come on and demo it. So you are absolutely welcome. And if you end up hitting that, okay, so it looks like there's Jonathan. Peace of the Saints. Sorry, let me uh, connect my Peace of the Saints. Um, <laughs> the Saints. My... Okay. Okay, the brother's internet is really choppy right now. The brother might actually be in Eritrea. Uh, Jonathan, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna pull you out of the call, but um, you know, I'll, I'll check back on you in a little bit. Maybe your internet is caught up. Maybe now. How's how's it right now? Yeah. Talk to me. I think everything's all right now. I don't know. What it was all right. So, um, but ever since you started up with the studio, you've been going crazy. I can tell that you've been uh, playing with everything like that. I, I respect that. I appreciate it. Hey, you see me um, out here? So, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, so, my thing is, how do you say when you start your first um, product-based business or business in general, expect to fail. Um, you know, expect the first three, four, five to fail until you get the uh, good one going. And that's kind of where my mind is right now because there's a... Uh, I could work on my father's business because he has something that he's starting up to or has been starting up. And uh, that one, I think you can get really a lot more uh, scaling. But uh, what I would like to do now is there's a specific, uh, like a hat type of products that I um, wanted to integrate a feature and I have an ideal market that I would like to uh, push it upon. So that's where my okay. uh, question in the cash up was. Um, sure. Like, do you think it's a solid market to begin trying out with? in order to continue and get the experience of getting it done? Um, the hat industry is good in as much as generally hats are one size fits all unless you're doing you know, fitted hats, which have a significant number of sizing options. You know, Either a hat is one size fits all or there's like two or three sizes top. So it's a good market to be in. In as much as that's the case, we also have to acknowledge that it at some level is seasonal. So if you're selling to certain markets that have winters, people buy beanies in the winter, not hats. And so you'll experience that kind of seasonality. Brandon, one of the saints whom I, you know, I welcome you to contact uh, via Discord, he's one of the members as well. He did a hat prop, uh, a hat product, and he experienced that seasonality in terms of his sales dropping off during a certain couple months and then picking back up. But you know, a hat is not a bad product to get started with and get some experience. And one thing I want you all to know is that uh, in business, you only have to win one time. You can fail thirty business. It really doesn't matter if the thirty-first one is successful and you know you're set for the rest of your life. So practice is the key in being able to get through the full cycle of business ideation, prototyping, negotiation. Uh, manufacturing, sales, marketing, customer service. When you get through that uh, cycle a number of times, you'll be good at it and you'll be able to apply that know-how to any kind of product which will benefit you. So yes, is the answer. Yeah, I get started. Yeah, I bet that. Um, I'm just, like I've told you a bunch of times, I've been going through Boston University and uh, 
conference two footage and just to be specific i did mean beanies and i did uh understand because oh, especially okay. being very oh. winter based yes so um yeah. there's just there's a flaw i see it with it uh with people that have hair respectfully um <laughs> so i just wanted to fix that up <laughs> don't worry you're gonna get yours too though i'm, I'm gonna send you out yeah. one, sorry. <laughs> you, you know, be a handicap one <laughs> like this is for the people who are hair disabled i appreciate nah, you nah you know you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I know you should look back one day with the with the jokes. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen, right. man, y'all playing with me. I might I might grow mine out because I saw Princella and her hairline is like right here. So if she got the nerve to have her hair, I might grow like because mine is my hairline is respectable. You hear me? I'm just not thick like I want to be. You dig? It's respectable though. Now nah, you're making it player though. You're making it player though. Listen, man, I, I'm I'm bringing. I'm not gonna say I'm bringing ball head back because I don't know if it was ever in like that. But uh, you know, I am the ball head lover, bro. You got anything else for us? Absolutely not. I appreciate everything. Peace to the Saints. Peace to the Saints. See you soon. See you. Right, so we will pop in, Sir Whitley. Hey, can you hear me? <laughs> Good to see you again. Yes, we can hear you. Good to see you as well. Peace to the Saints. Peace to the Saints. So, essentially, I just uh, this is my product, uh, Meet Phoebe. Actually, uh, I've developed this my my own for the past uh, seven to eight months. It's been a nice. tough grind here. So, <laughs> it get like that. Man, it's tough. But essentially, this is a uh, community based social media event listening platform. Um, and I, I'm just browse through it real quick. Uh, uh, first, first, how do you make money? So the way that we would make money is through the community. Uh, we would charge communities for hosting their, uh, or charge people for hosting their communities on this platform. Uh, at the at the moment, our price will be five dollars a month, and right. also we're going to allow the communities to charge like a membership fee as well. And we will take a portion out of that, uh, maybe like 3% out of, uh, or no, uh, 30%. I'm going to cut you off a couple of times. And we, we've had a consultation before, and I, I know you you know, you know really be in this game. So you know yeah. I'm going to cut you off a couple of times. We just want to run through a couple of things. So, uh, and I want everyone to be able to hear why you're thinking as you're thinking. And I also want you to you know question your own thinking appropriately. So how many, I'm just going to ask you a bunch of questions really quickly. How many buy uh, paying customers do you currently have? Zero. Okay, it's not fair enough. Easy. And I've been there. I've been there many times, many times. Mm -hmm. Okay, so great. So we have zero paying customers. And tell the audience again your revenue model. So essentially, we're going to charge communities as well as also uh, events listing fee as well. Um, about five dollars a month okay, for. So I need sharper. So, so number one. One thing you'll, you'll probably remember from our consultation or if you're taking the practicum course, and I highly recommend that for folks uh, who aren't, your revenue model and everything that you do should be very simple and clean. So how do you make money? Boom. Like it's just boom. Like for example, I'm running Fletch, right? I, I don't currently run Fletch, but say when I was a CEO of Fletch, how do you make money? We charge $5 per student to use our attendance technology. That's simple, right? That's simple. Now, yes. uh, how do you make money one way, not two ways? Because you have zero uh, paying customers. So just give me one way, your best way, your best trick. How do you make money? We charge communities $5 a month. Cool. Very good. And that's reasonable. That sounds reasonable. Now, let's dig in. So we charge communities $5 a month. Um, there are two pieces we could dig in on. One, what the hell are communities? <laughs> All right. So you're charging communities. How do you charge communities? What do you mean? So uh, essentially they are, um, well, to answer your first question, what are communities? Communities are people who uh, will essentially just go through this tab and create a community. And Got you. They so also you, charge, you charge community organizers $5 yes, a month. Organizers. Now, I want you to remember this language because it's clearer and it's sharp. And when you're talking either to a potential buyer a pot or a potential user, or an investor or potential collaborator, you want to be sharp and clear and you want them to understand you the first time. So I, or not we, uh, whatever your website is, dot com. So website.com charges community organizers $5 per month 
to do fill in the blank. Okay. All right. So we got that part. Now, here's the second piece. What uh, or, or why are you doing it monthly instead of a one-time fee? Uh, we want the recurring revenue. Um, yes. That's what you want. That's what you yeah, want. Correct. Want now, it. yes. that's good. And I would want the recurring revenue too. Re recurring revenue is much better. And I think that when your business is developed and you have something called brand equity, recurring revenue is going to be your bread and butter. Correct. And the app brand equity, because you don't currently have any brand equity. Uh, do you know what brand equity is? Uh, no. Could I, you, um, yeah, sure. I'm, so brand equity is me, could mean a number of things. But in this case, we're talking about trust in your brand, right? So for example, um, I'll, give, I'll give you a, an example that's close to all of us. So I'm doing a trip in 2024, right? For people to join the trip, I said, hey, send your money to this cash app below. You got to have a lot of trust to send a couple thousand dollars to a cash app, right? You have to have a lot of trust. Mm -hmm. Brand equity. I have brand equity, meaning there's trust in my brand that Marquette is not going to screw you over. If you send Marquette $3,000, whatever you sent it to him for, you're either going to get the product or you're going to get the experience because over time, we've seen that he delivers. He's a reliable character, right? If I was just like a brand new YouTuber and I was like, hey, send me $3,000. People be like, bro, like, is there a website I could go to? Like, I'm not going to send it to your cash app. Like, do you have a website? Or like, they want it more formal because there's no brand equity. There's no trust in the brand. The reason we mentioned brand equity is because there's nothing wrong with a recurring monthly subscription. That's brilliant. Except if no one's ever used your technology before, they're like, damn, I'm going to sign up. Even if it's just $5, I'm going to sign up for $5. I just want to, what do they want to do? They want to try it out. So they want to figure out if it's good. Now, granted, they don't have to try it out for free, but they're not necessarily trying to get into a position to where they're going to be rebuilt every month and they might forget to cancel the recurring membership if they aren't paying attention. So it's going to disincentivize some of your more casual consumers. And most of your consumers are going to be suspicious because they don't know the brand. So I think your ultimate business model absolutely should be monthly recurring subscription. Yes. But to start with, to get people to try you out, it's far more likely that you're going to convert a transaction by having it be a one-time charge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So, so that's number one. And mind you, everyone, if you ever take a consultation with me or if you're like on a call right now, and Mr. Whitley has taken consultations before, so we've done this. He's, he's a great technologist, by the way. This is the kind of guy you want to become friends with and do business with and work with, right? An honorable, skilled man. Uh, but remember, even an expert, they're giving you their expert opinion. It's expert, but it's also an opinion. So you needn't take anything that anyone says wholesale. I am certain of this, uh, that you're going to get more conversions by having it be a one-time charge. Because here's the thing. Say you, I go on your website. I'm suspicious of you. So I'm willing to do it because it's a one-time charge. Product is amazing. Amazing. But that one-time charge, how much usage did that get me? Got me 30 days, right? Mm -hmm. So then I try to log back in on day 31. What happens? Uh, the community will be, uh, it will show like a, uh, you must pay the community or else it will be shut down in the next 30 days. Bingo. So, I'm going to get a modal to, to purchase it again. So if you did your job adding value, I'm going to mm -hmm. buy it again. And here's what I would do when you pop up that modal. So the first purchase, maybe it'd be $6 one-time purchase. Then when I click on the 31st day, because it was a great product, I would pop up a modal. Hey, you can continue using this website for $5 a month. It was $6 to start. Now it's $5. We'll give you a discount if you opt into monthly recurring. And if they don't want to do it, I'd have a small link below that that says, you know, purchase another 30 days for $5. Ah, okay. So, so that's just increasing your first transaction rate. And honestly, the most important thing in your business right now is not monthly recurring. It's just getting people to try it. <laughs> you know, just to try, just get users is step one, get users, whatever the product is. Step one, get some damn users. Step two, convert a transaction, one-time transaction. Step, step three, monthly recurring or annual recurring, whatever the hell is, depending on your business. Mm -hmm. But you got to tear it up realistically. Okay, great. We got that. Now, mind you, here's number one, Mr. Whitley. Remember, money, money. We're talking about as a business, money. So don't ever come on here like, oh, I'm going to tell you how this works. And you click this. And I don't give a, I need to see the money first. It's a business. So now we got the money out the way. 
Now let's mm-hmm. talk product. I love product too, but the yeah. money has to come. Yeah. It, so uh, we're also take us, in- say again. Take us back one step. I think you like click something. So take us to your uh, take us back one step if you don't mind. Is this live? Is this running off of your local uh, your local machine or is this uh, on the web? Well, this what I'm demonstrating to you right now is local, but it is live okay. at the moment. Okay, cool. I was just curious. Yeah. So another, uh, there's more features to come. We're going to add a uh, discoverability, like uh, an explore tab. Just, tell, me, just tell us what you got right here. Cause we're, this is not a consultation, right? So we don't have okay. uh, that much time like we usually would. So just tell us what you got. Yeah. So uh, there's content posts right here. You could like, uh, leave a comment. Okay. All right. And also we got messages uh, as well. You can also, um, so an organizer can message their uh, group or anyone in the group can message anyone in the group? Uh, there's direct group communities as well as event chats. Oh, very good. And this all looks beautifully uh, designed, simple, fairly clear. Um, I wouldn't have known that you could scroll horizontally on that one, but everything looks pretty good. Yes, yes. We're also working on like um, better user accessibility. Uh, this design is still in place um there's much yeah, the more- accessibility the accessibility and, and for everyone watching what does accessibility mean that you know for people who have uh you know various disability types uh, that comes late honestly i wouldn't even waste time with that because here's the thing if you have a parking garage right so say you open a parking garage you know you'd have to have like 300 parking spaces before you need to have one uh, handicap space does that make sense Yes, yes. But you need 300 parking spaces before you even need to have one handicap space because most of the persons coming to park are not handicapped. So I wouldn't even waste time on that because you might figure out this business sucks and you didn't build all this disab- disabled accessible stuff. And it's like, bro, like nobody, even the people who are not handicapped ain't using it. So you always have to have the priorities in order. Um, and that's why I'm glad we're talking. Um, carry on. Uh, let me put you back on the screen. What else you got for us? Um, got a My Communities tab. Uh, see a list of your communities. Um, also a community post uh, chat a channel. Um, you can see upcoming events. Currently, this one has no events coming. Okay, and- brilliant. So one thing I want you to do is when you're doing things like this, I want you to think of it as an investor pitch always. And which is to say, I'm trying to get some money. Hear me. I'm trying to get you to give me $50,000. And the best way to give an investor pitch when you're taking someone through your product, you're giving a demo, is to take them through a, a, a use case. And it should be the most common use case. So, hey, Marquette, um, I'm going to go through this and I'm going to be like, give me an example of a use case. Like who's an organizer of a community? Uh, most common for your bit. Um, uh, fraternities. Fraternities. Yeah, uh, perhaps we're gonna uh, run with that. We're gonna run with that, but I want you to be suspicious because college kids are not the most financially liquid people. Now they do have five dollars, but in general, they're not the most financially liquid. They're always gonna look to hack together something for free. But anyway, so okay, so I'm a fraternity president, and I want to use your technology for what exactly? What's the use case? Uh, to manage like uh, your community, like uh, to manage your members as well, to like uh, promote events that's going around. Uh, for your promote it to my members or to to like the promote, public uh there's privacy's uh privacy options that you can include uh you can promote it to your members only or okay, i want you to i want you to go back through this uh and think of a case study i want you to be a lot sharper on this one and i'll tell you why so i actually founded a fraternity i was a president of a fraternity for two years formally and then a year before that uh organizing the fraternity so you're actually talking to like a guy who's done this i did this many years ago but even Many years ago, like for example, the fraternity that I founded, Alpha Tau Omega, their national organization provides you software that you can use to uh, engage alumni as well as current members. And then when you're looking at the social side, throwing a party, like this is something that you're going to create bids for. You're going to give the bid, uh, each member has four bids. They can give it out to people. It's a bit tactile of a process. Um, you got guest lists and things like that. A lot of these things have, uh, they're institutionalized, you know, they there's not a strong need. So for your product, you want to be able to provide a very clear value add. And when you have a very clear value add, you will be able to say that very briefly and succinctly and clearly. I'll give you an example. Um, Fletch, again, this is a company that I ran that did very well. 
you have a university classroom with 300 students. How do you take attendance? The professor's gonna be like, oh, I, I, I don't know. I'm like, you're gonna stand there and call out 300 names? Uh, no. How do you take attendance? You don't take attendance. I know that for a fact. I have a technology that when everyone walks in the classroom, it instantly takes attendance. No one has to lift a finger. Would you like that? Yeah. How's that work? Oh, it works by, we have a Bluetooth beacon on the wall and it communicates with everyone's phone and they'll have a pre-installed app on there or their iPad, whatever, you know, if you issue iPads, it'll work with that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. You don't have to learn anything. You don't have to lift a finger. But hey, guess what? You're legally required to take attendance. Did you know that? Federal financial aid legally requires you to take attendance. And if you don't take attendance, your school's going to lose financial aid money. So you have a clear need. You need to take attendance. You have no way to take attendance. I can help you do that. And you don't have to learn anything. You don't have to do anything differently. You just carry on as before. The only thing you need to do is pay me $5 per student. That's it. And that goes for the whole year very clear value add. It's hard to say no to that. There's a real problem and I don't have a way to solve the problem. I don't have another solution I hacked together. There's nothing that I'm currently using. Like I could pass around a paper to 300 people. What's the issue? Someone else signs in for someone else. It's very easy. Who has two cell phones to pre-install my app on both cell phones and the kid's going to give up their cell phone for a whole hour and then have a trouble finding the other person to regain their cell phone? There's no other good solution. It's a clear value add. I want you to be able to identify a very clear value add. This type of person needs my technology. They need to be able to do this. I help them do this and I charge them this. That's it. It should be literally one sec, one sentence. Very clear. Like always think in terms of how can I make this one sentence? No more than three sentences. Short, clear sentences. Thank you very much uh, for coming on. I'm sure we'll see you again. Congratulations on the technology. I know it takes a long time to build technology. I know you've put a lot on, uh, into that uh, technology and you have infinite potential. So I'm excited to see what you do. Thank you. Absolutely. A pleasure. Shout out to the, the technologists coming on here because they see, look, they don't know what it takes to build that. The man, how long have you been at that? Man, eight months, probably like 50, 60 hours a week, probably more than yes. that. But I work a full-time job as well. Like yes. 40 hours eight before. months working full-time on this thing for eight months. This is not a game. And that's why I tell you guys, take the practicum course, because if you're going to put eight months into anything, you're going to want to get paid at some point. Am I wrong, brother? You're going to want to get paid, right? Hell it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, believe that. So take that practicum course so you guys can make sure you do it right. And remember, everything you engage as a business needs to make money. So there can't be a, a thing of like, I might make money. No, forget all that. We must make money, especially once we're eight months in. We're going to expect to convert some money. And one of the beautiful things about this experience, you got some feedback on your revenue model. You can sharpen that up. And I'm happy to take more time with Mr. Whitley because we've had consultations before, correct? Yes. Absolutely. And then the second thing, so you sharpen up your revenue model, which is the first and foremost, always lead with the money in all conversations, everything. Get obsessed with that. That's number one. Then number two, remember, no one cares about what your technology does, all the bells and whistles. They want to hear a clear story, a one, two, three, ABC story, which is to say that you need to identify a case study, the most common use case and say, hey, I'm a fraternity president. I need to be able to do this. I currently can't do it, so I'm going to use this technology called Phoebe.com, and this is what I would do as a fraternity president. I do this, and then I do this, and then I do this, and then it allows me to do this. Wow, that's really helpful and valuable to me. That's what you want to do. Don't ever go through all the features. Nobody cares, especially an investor. They don't have time. And remember, when you're talking to investors, they're smart. These people are multimillionaires. They're not dumb. So they, they can imagine what you're about to say before you can say it half the time. When you're like, oh, I have messaging in their mind. They're like, yeah, you can message this person, message that person. Great. Carry on. What's the next thing? Right. So make sure that you're really banging it out and adding value quickly because people mention an elevator speech. Well, grand, I've never given a, a pitch in an elevator, but I have given a lot of pitches and their patience is very low. Mostly they can figure out if you got the goods or not deliver it quick and get the hell out of the way and wait for a yes or a no. And here's the thing. They're not going to BS you. A lot of times I'm like, I'm out. Or they'll be like, hey, contact my due diligence person. Send over your deck and send over this. That's basically saying I'm 80% in. If you can do what I asked you to do, I'm 100% in. Carrying on, pleasure to meet you, Mr. Whitley. I'll see you next week. Yes, thank you. Peace to the saints. Peace to the saints. 
Saints, I, I hope you see you guys aren't in that business, so you don't know what that takes, but that's a that's a competitive business. That's why I created the practicum course. And it, it is the best in the there's nothing better than that practicum course. And that man put a lot of work in. It might look simple, but technology is not simple. It's expensive and it's time consuming. And you guys better respect that man. Saint KH, talk to me, boss. Uh peace of the saints. Peace of the saints. This man, say, is college, you. This, this man has showed up in the college video. <laughs> he got the matching MDB label drip. Shout out, bro. Oh, and yes, side sir. note, the man got hands too. The man boxing skills is crazy. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say shout out to Marquise. You know, eight months on the technology, that's that's insane. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad to see uh, all the Saints building stuff, you know. And uh, shout out to the Chicago Saints doing what they're doing, too. You know, same flows. You got the MDB wash on and then Shane Grayton is doing his thing. So I just want to say that. And also, thank you for making me letting me make arrangements on the Vietnam trip as well. Absolutely. And, you know, it's love between the folks that we know. Right. And, you know, we run this like a family and you, you always show love to your family. So absolutely. We have full trust and faith. For sure. Well, I don't want to waste uh, too much of your time. I know a lot of people want to get on the live, but I appreciate you letting me get on. Uh, kind of the, the big thing I'm kind of like having trouble with is like my uh, goals and the areas of like health, wealth and relationship, especially um, staying focused on them. OK. So just so, in like, general, you're staying focused on these the goals in these three areas. Yeah, because I I I find myself in this like perpetual cycle of like I have trouble staying in the present, so I always think about the past or the future, and I'm kind of like, having trouble staying in the present. I'm also dealing like a lot of imposter syndrome in college because uh, I didn't come from. I'm the first person in my uh, family to go to college, and you know, and I I I have lost connections with my family, but I feel disconnected because of that, and uh, just like the classes can be a big difficult, especially now. So I just feel like, you know, is this for me? And then also trying to work on top of that. I feel like I'm always fighting the need to, you know, work full time versus, you know, stay consistent in college. Cause you know, it's a four year, it's a, it's not a sprint. It's a, it's a marathon. Right. So like in the yeah. areas of health, I, I mentioned this to you, like in health, I'm, I'm working out with my friend. Uh, we've been working out every day, uh, during the week and, like, it's been going good. We've been doing mostly hybrid training, weight training, whatnot, but I always want, I want to get back in a boxing gym. Right. So I'm like yes. saying, oh, should I just forget weights and get back in the boxing gym or try because I can't consistently get to the boxing gyms. Like do what you can do consistently. You can whiff lace consistently. So do that or get back in the boxing gym and go try to go to a national tournament. And then with uh, so that's health and then wealth. You know, I did achieve my goal of making um, I say I exceeded my goal. I wanted to make twenty two dollars an hour. I made twenty two fifty now. So I, I exceeded my goal of that. But now I'm like, you know, I want to start a, you know, start a product in the vertical like for work. I do health and safety. Uh, okay. So I'm a safety coordinator and I have a mentor who helps me out a lot with that. But now I'm like, oh, well, do I want to start a product or just stick to what I'm good at, which is health and safety? Because you say do what people are passionate about paying you for. So right now yeah. I'm good at health and safety. That's what people want to pay me for. But then also I want to learn supply chain and data. Like there's all this other stuff coming in, but like, I should get focused. Then like relationships, uh, I'm having trouble like building. And I say meeting for relationships. I feel like I have trouble building relationships with people my age and um I feel like I connect more with people older than me, but I don't feel like that translates into like relationships, especially with like women. So I think those are like my major troubles, I would say. I appreciate that. So the most important thing is to be able to listen to yourself. And often when I'm on a consultation with someone, whether it's a consultation about business, marriage, divorce, uh, relationships, self, uh, self-improvement, whatever the case is, my number one task is to listen. And that's primarily because most people are not listening to themselves. <laughs> Right. So I, I take <laughs> yeah. everything that you say. And sometimes all I do is I mirror it back to you. And then you're like, ah, you know, ah, I know what I need to do. And then sometimes, you know, I have to, you know, kick someone's ass because they're not kicking their own ass. So the first thing that we notice in your case is that you have a lot going on. You have a lot going on. We've all been here in Boston University. You know, we often talk about, you know, you create a list of things you need to do. And then there are a number of ways that you reorganize it and segment it so that you know where to focus. And I'm often reemphasizing simplicity. Now, you described troubles. You didn't describe goals. You described troubles, which is fine because that lets us know where you are right now. And college can be a time of like, you know, strange ups and downs emotionally and feeling out of place and feeling disconnected. Even when you're among a bunch of people, I remember this feeling. And that's what kind of one of the reasons I started fraternity because of that, especially if you're at a large college. Now, here's the number one thing for you. You have a lot going on. Ha, that's fine. You're not going to fix all those things you name. Sometimes 
if you can fix one big thing, it might fix some of the other smaller things. So your goal right now is to ask yourself, and usually you find this out in meditation, in silence, or on a long run, what is bothering me the most? Listen, what is bothering me the most? What troubles my mind most frequently and most heavily? Find what that biggest problem is, write it down clearly, and work only on fixing that one problem. The other problems, let them continue to be problems. Try to fix that one problem. And if you can make some movement on that, you'll start to feel good. You'll get some momentum, and then you'll be able to have the freedom to think. So that's the first piece of advice. Find the biggest problem that's bothering, because you're bothered right now. You're not, you're not really talking about achieving goals. You're talking about there's a lot of trouble. So let's mitigate that. One, what's the biggest problem? And then let's start working on that. Then secondly, mindset. You have to realize that every time you choose to do something, you at the same time choose not to do something else. When you choose to be a great boxer, you also might be choosing to not be a great basketball player. I love basketball. If you guys follow me on Instagram, I'm at Marquette Devon, you can see me balling in Puerto Rico. I'm looking good out there. I love basketball. But when I chose to start boxing, I also chose to stop playing basketball. So often when you choose to do something, you're choosing not to do something else, which is to say, you can't do everything. You have to acknowledge that. And once you let go of something, it's gone. It's done. It's gone. Gone and done, which goes to your piece about not living in the present. One thing we all have to know is that there's only one place of peace. That is the present. The past is a place of regret. The future is a place of anxiety. The present is a place of peace. When I say the past is a place of regret, you know, if you have the past and it's haunting you, it's usually regret, things you didn't do correctly, things you wish you did differently. But here's the funny thing. There's no undo button. So there's, there's no, it's not worthwhile going back and looking over the ashes of a burned bridge. The future is a place of anxiety, anxiousness. Oh, what if this? What if that? What if I can't do this? It's anxiety. Here's the funny thing. Most of your fears never come true. And you know, most of the things we're scared about, it never comes true. I kid you not. I had this assistant in South Africa. This is a hilarious to me, probably not to her, but you know, a little uh, red bone chick, colored chick in South Africa, a big booty girl too, uh, cute in the face, definitely promiscuous. Um, of course, I ain't touch her, you're me. But I remember she was telling me one time, she says, you know, uh, she used to call me Marquette in her accent. It was a bit annoying, but what can you do? These chicks are dumb. Um, she says, you know, Marquette, I, for a time, I was scared to go to the doctor because I'd been involved with a guy and there was a rumor that he had HIV and I didn't know if I had it too. And so rather than like going and facing the news, seeing a doctor to find out, I, I just didn't go to the doctor because I thought maybe I have HIV and I was like, I'd rather just like not know and just die maybe. And she's like, so for like months, every day, I thought I was getting sicker and I thought I was not feeling well. So I say that to say, this broad lived five months of her life, paranoid that she had HIV AIDS and was dying. Lived five whole months anticipating, being anxious about a future uh, in which she would die of HIV AIDS for five months. Here's the funny thing. She eventually goes to the doctor, gets tested, and she has nothing. Doctor says, you don't have HIV, you don't have AIDS, you don't have any STDs. You're in perfect health. You're a young woman in your early 20s. You're in good health. Which is to say, she was living in a future, an uncertain future, that the bad thing never happened. And so in the present, she suffered. That's what we, we allow our minds to do, to play tricks on us. We suffer for not having control over our minds. So faith plays prominently faith, whether your faith is God, whether your faith is a saint in the center on your shoulder, reminding you of the right thing, whether your faith comes from some academic knowledge you have, whatever it comes from, it should remind you to stay firmly footed in the present. It should remind you the truth is that most of the bad things you're worried about will never happen. They'll never come to fruition. And if you can start just on those three things that I identified, you'll be off to a good start. Number one, I'll recap. Number one, um, Find the problem that is the biggest, most bothersome trouble that you have. Address that one exclusively. Who cares about the other things? Number two, accept that as a human being, you have limited time on this earth, limited capacity, limited energy. And when you choose to do something, you're choosing not to do other things. It's fine. It's okay. 
even running a corporation, you know, sometimes my assistant would say, Hey, Marquette, you know, you got to do this. I say, ah, I do. I should do that, but I'm not going to do it. It's not going to get done. It's fine. I'm comfortable with that. It's okay. Some things are going to fail. I just need this one thing to work. So I'm, so remember some things I'm going to do other things I'm not going to do. It's okay if they don't get done. And then the third thing is living in the past is a regretful place. Living in the present is a peaceful, pleasant place. Living in the future is an anxious place. Stay in the present. And remember, most of the things you're imagining that are bad in the future, they never happen. I know this from lived experience because I'm older than you. All right. Anything else? Um, yeah, one more thing. I think you, you really bring up a good point about the, you know, most things you worry about never happen, you know, and right. I, I really need to remember that. And I think, you know, a lot of this just comes from age, me being young and seeing everybody else, you know, getting things and, you know, having the things that you want, but you have to realize, you know, things come, uh, not to say in due time, but things, things are proportional to your efforts. So if you're putting in the effort in, and like you said earlier, um, it doesn't matter if you start 31 businesses and 30 failed, if the one be, you don't have to win once. Right. So that's something I need to keep in mind. And I think, uh, a big, a big part of, um, my, my struggle is like relationships. I always worry about like the dating market and stuff like that. And then how I, I feel like, like I said, connecting with people, connecting with women my age, I always feel like disconnected because they kind of see me as like an anomaly. They'd be like, uh, I'm like, I don't smoke or drink. So I feel like that right. disconnects me. And then also I'm people say I'm really serious all the time. I'm like, I'm not that like, it takes people time to know me. So I feel like that yeah. hinders me. Yeah, it's going to do numbers. And it's the same thing as business in actual fact, which is to say that, you know, you might have to go to 30 businesses that fail and then the 31st one is successful. And then the same thing is true in romance. You might have to talk to 100, uh, 100 chicks and then the 101 chick is going to be like the one that you want to uh, deal with. You find her to be suitable. I, I, You guys have no idea how many women I deal with that I'm just like, God damn, like, you just are not a worthwhile person. <laughs> like, I'm telling you. And sometimes, you know, the woman that you don't get a chance to deal with is a blessing. You, you know, it's a blessing. And here's the funny thing. If you're a man of merit, when a woman doesn't want you, it says more about her than you, right? You know, you got women who will overlook a man who is intelligent, well put together, articulate, calm, poised, and go for a guy who has his pants sagging, right? Because he has swag, right? A guy who can scarcely speak English. So it says more about them than you. But at the end of the day, it's a business process again. And you should engage that pursuit of women with the same business mindset and objectivity, knowing that it'll take time. It's a volume play. And sometimes it's a, a location matters. And what I mean by that is the nature of a woman you would find in Cincinnati, Ohio, or you know, a, a city in Kentucky is radically different than the nature of a woman in Miami. So if you're in Miami shop, shopping for a housewife, you're going to be shopping for a long time. If you're in uh, you know, Ohio, Kentucky shopping for a, a, a wife, you, you might find one fairly quickly. And so location matters a lot. And also time, the temporal setting matters. You know, chicks in college, you're, you're me like half of these chicks, they just trying to you know, go and get drunk and and do something promiscuous uh you know and that's that's the time in their life and there are lovely women who might not go to college at all there are other women who might come from a conservative family and go to a women's college there are different things and you know you don't have to be worried about any of this you just have to know that it's a process and you have to engage the process with full faith that it works out and it does you're, you're a young man you have a tremendous amount of time and by the time you've mastered that process you might even find bro it's time for me to be a player i found a great one but i i'm not even ready now i'm about to keep running it up you know like you, you don't know what the future holds but what you know for certain is that you're a young man you have time thank you for joining and uh sharing this uh perspective with us and being vulnerable and i'm um, looking forward to hearing good news from you is there a piece of the saints Peace to the saints. And of course, congratulations. I forgot to share with the saint on his financial goal achieved. He wanted to go for 22 an hour. He got to 2250. It's always a, a beautiful thing to be able to exceed our goals. That's lovely. May I acknowledge Chris? He writes, peace to the saints. And I hope you're paying attention. I hope they are paying attention, spending a lot of knowledge, Mr. Bray. They have no idea the kind of value delivered. Like they have no, like even with uh, Mr. Whitley, if he takes the advice that I gave him, that's the kind of advice that's going to, you know, that can take you from like being stalled out to skyrocketing. Mohammed writes, boss, thanks for 
acknowledging my comment, even when I didn't super chat. You're welcome. He writes, have you heard of entrepreneurship through acquisition before? Search funds. Yeah, there's many ways to become an entrepreneur. There are also intrapreneurs, people who are innovating and running business units within large corporations. One thing I did that I probably don't mention enough is you know, large companies like, for example, Procter & Gamble, they would hire me to come in and you know, talk to their technical folks mostly and drive innovation within the company. It's very hard for large corporations to innovate. But yeah, you know, there's franchising. There, there's an infinite number of ways to do something. Byron writes, Peace of Saints. I'm an electrician by trade in Saint City. Oh, that's a, that's a good trade. If you need anything regarding installation, or repair, just say the word. You shared yeah, your shared wisdom uh, has paid for my services. I appreciate that, Byron. We got to remember that we got an electrician in Saint City. That's that's a beautiful thing. So I really do appreciate that. I probably got to um, share that with my assistant to remember. So we can definitely take you up. Thank you very much. That means a lot. In fact, I, I send a message right now. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. That that really does mean a lot. And again, shout out to the skilled men who have things to offer, things to, to barter and add value. I acknowledge Vernell comes in via Cash App. He writes, uh, Peace of the Saints tuition will catch the replay. My, I acknowledge uh, Montrell. He writes, does Boss University include all of the conference? Well, Boss University is not a conference, so it does not include conference footage. Um so yeah, and feel free to send me a DM if there's uh, particular things that you'd like to know, like is, is this included? It, it's pretty far reaching. I, I, I've not heard anyone take Boston University and, and, and find that they were, they were yearning for anything, but feel free to send me a message. We'll make sure that we can get you uh, what you need. And we want to see all of our guys and, and our lady saints as well. Very successful. Thank you for your question. I acknowledge Khalil. He writes, may I join the live? Okay, so he already did. Shout out to Johnny. Sense of tuition, truly appreciate it. May I acknowledge um, one of the saints just uh, joined as a member. He just joined on marquetism.com. So we will welcome him warmly to this thing of ours. It's always good to, to grow this organization. <laughs> shout out to... Shout out to Major Mind and Soul. Oh. <laughs> <This> man is, <laughs> Peace to the Saints. <laughs> Peace to the Saints. How are you? Peace to the Saints. Hey, I got to do what I got to do. I can't get into the bicep gym all the time, so I got to do what I got to do today. I can dig it. All right. So I have one just real specific question for you. I, it's To be fair, it's kind of a general question, but it's on this, on this topic. It's fairly specific. <clears throat> Can you hear me? I hear you. All right, cool. So, um, as you know, I have a, a product with Assassin that I'm working on right now, um, and the I'm waiting for the order to come in. And as far as I know, as far as I can think of, at least, I'm just kind of in no man's land right now. So my question to you is really, what are some things that I can do while I wait for the, the, the shipment to arrive um, so that I'm most prepared to hit the ground running when product comes in, you know, get everything going and you know, get the dollars coming in? Very good. And when you say product, I presume you're speaking of a bulk order for this particular yeah. product. Yes. Right. Very good. Congratulations on that. That's, that's big. Um, and, you know, you... You put your money where your mouth is and you've gotten started and that's really the part that most people mess up on is the action <laughs> so congratulations on that with regards to the particular product I, I think i know the one that you're speaking of and the number one thing that you will need to do once the uh, bulk order does arrive to you <clears throat> is you'll need to make sure that we have everything for the listing um so i think i i know which brand this one is going under i believe this is a assassinbrand.com product and so if I were you, I would send over the listing, which hopefully you have photographs from your manufacturer. So you can send the photographs from the manufacturers, uh, the price per piece. And if you haven't figured it out yet, I would advise you to um, check into the shipping costs if you need uh, help with a resource for that. 
you can email support at marquettism.com and we can send you back a resource, but figure out what the shipping cost will be. And that'll allow us to go ahead and complete that listing and post that up. Also, I would figure out, you know, what your ETA is in terms of product arriving to you. Um, and then we can you know, start figuring out how to you know, get things flowing for you. Okay. Hey, simple yeah. enough. <laughs> It'll be I pretty appreciate easy. you letting me come on. Absolutely. And how many units do you have coming in? Um, 100. 100. Okay. That's pretty good. Yeah. And you know what I like about your product is actually it, it's core. It's uh, it's aligned with a, a lot of our core, um, you know, activities and product lines. So that's good. And it's also can be used for other things as well. So so not just, you know, what we're thinking of in particular can also be used for other things. So that's really good. I think you'll do really well um, in, in getting this thing sold. And it's fairly lightweight if, if you're still working on what I thought you're working on. Mm -hmm. So you should have good um, low cost shipping. So great. Fantastic. Keep us updated. Do send that over and um, it we'll uh, add that as a draft. And as soon as you tell us, hey, you know, this thing is um, two days out. You know, I looked at the tracking is two days out. We'll just go ahead and put it live and uh, we can go ahead and start uh, getting that promoted for you. So, yes, sir. All right. Oh, yeah. By the way, shout out to um, uh, Dimitri, who produces that lovely robe you have on uh, the Hefner. You dig Dimitri uh, did a consultation. That's one of the dope products that came out of his consultation. And I believe you can get that one at the And uh, me, yeah, good. Let me just say about this robe. My wife put this robe on, right? Just because she, you know, you know how, you know how they do she, that, right? They just, yeah, too soft. Just yep. what they do. Okay. <laughs> she threw it all right. And she's like, oh my God. She's like, babe, this is a really nice robe. I was like, what do you think it was cheap? Of course. Uh, this is a very nice robe. For real, very comfortable. I, I back this role for real. Shout out. <laughs> I shout out. I actually got one too. You know, the it's funny that you say that because I'm at the um the headquarters right now, and, and just earlier I was saying like, you know, I would love, I'd like to have my robe here. So yeah. I'm gonna definitely get mine uh, over here. And as I said, uh, that product can be found at assassin.com. That's uh Dimitri's product that he made. Um, we, you know, again, always help with design and branding and marketing. Um, and I want to support you guys in your success. And Dimitri started with a consultation at marquetism.com. Uh, as I remind, though, I will be increasing price to $990 um, uh, very soon. I just need to figure out which. Oh, it's on Cozy Cow. So I got to go in to Cozy Cow to adjust the price. It's been a pleasure. Looking forward to uh, your product. Keep us posted. Yes, sir. Peace of the Saints. Fantastic. Let's see if we are caught. Shout out to uh, Mr. Pete. Comes in by Cash App. Sends intuition. Truly appreciate it. May I also acknowledge... Um, Mr. Jones, who just went on MDB label, got dripped up. Oh, he also got the um, the coasters. You know what? I actually meant to discontinue the coaster. I got the coasters too. You dig? I got some MDB label coasters. I got man and woman brand coasters, and I have uh, assassin brand coasters. I actually meant to disable uh, discontinue those. So you you snuck that in. <laughs> he snuck that in. He also copped the uh, fleece sweatpants. I was actually uh, working out in those earlier today because the temperature is starting to drop a little bit in St. City. And I also like to get my body warm. And so if it's chilly at all, I got to start off in long sleeve and sweatpants. So I was actually wearing an MDB label hoodie and the MDB label uh, fleece sweatpants, which are actually quite fly. You dig? So he just got dripped up. Shout out to him. May I acknowledge? Okay. Looks like we're, we're all caught up there. Saints, I'll give you a little bit of time to send in comments, questions, tuition as we wind down. And if you guys uh, like this segment, uh, we will bring it back uh, next week. Same place, same time.
may I acknowledge EJ writes tuition, prosperity to all pieces, saints, and indeed prosperity to all. I, I definitely believe in that and I love to see it. You dig? I want to see everyone winning. The world is a better p place when more people are prosperous. Shout to Jonathan. He writes, Peace of the Saints. We'll catch the rest in the replay. I must go get Boss University in a real way. I'll drop that one in the chat below. Um, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, I'll drop that one in the chat below. Uh, Saints, it's been a pleasure to have this time to fellowship with you. Let us end this with our tradition, the creed of the assassin. Repeat after me with full conviction, knowing this is true of you. The creed of the assassin. I am going to be who I truly am because I am remarkable and I'm going to strive every moment to show the greatest part of who I am. Until next time, peace of the saints.